last meeting due to obviously the sad passing of the Queen. Um, but uh, can I say I'm very appreciative um, that the you were able to actually remake today. Uh, I realise that with diaries, that's a really difficult thing to do at short notice, and it is very much uh, appreciated. Um, if I could maybe hand over to Gogo to actually do the housekeeping for the minute, and we'll get started after that. Thanks. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, everyone. Please note that the public section of the meeting will be recorded and published online for public access after the meeting. Can all attendees switch off their camera and mute their microphone when not speaking? The camera and microphone should only be switched on when you're invited to speak. If you wish to speak, please use the raise your hand icon on the toolbar. I will now ask members participating today to confirm their attendance once their name has been announced so that it is clear in the recording of the minute and can also be record for the meeting. Thank you. So I'm about to take the attendance. Councillor Nico? Present. Kate Steven? Alistair Robertson? Angela Scott. Present. Caroline Hicks-Cox. Jay Ewing. Present. Yvonne Boyd. Present. Good afternoon. Gail VT. Jonathan Smith. Luan Grosjean. Hi, good afternoon. Present. Councillor Radley. Present. Pete Edwards. Richard McCarlan. Present. Councillor McDonald. Present. Simon Rayner. Susan Webb. Present. And we've got apologies from Duncan Cockburn, Matthew Lockley, Neil Cowie, Paul O'Connor. As for Paul O'Connor, we've got Sarah Chu in the meeting here. Sarah, can you say hello, please? Present. Thank you. And I've got William Hardy as a sub for Duncan Cockburn. William, please, can you say hello to us? Present. Hi there, everyone. OK. And Chair, we've got Councillor Greg saying he'll be arriving later for the meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much. And can I take this opportunity to welcome uh, Yvonne Boyd from Skills Development Scotland uh, as a new member uh, and also to welcome Sarah and William to the meeting. Uh, thank you very much indeed for coming along. That's most appreciated. Um, moving on uh, to the agenda uh, as such. Um, we have uh, the minutes. Uh, sorry, we have the declarations of interest uh, or has anybody got a declaration of interest? Not seeing any hands and I'm not seeing anything on the screen, so I'll take it there are none. Um, minutes of the CPA board meeting of 6th of July 2022 uh, found on pages 3 to 14. Can we agree the minute? Thank you. Um, we also have the draft CPA management group minute of the 17th of August uh, for information. Is there any questions on that? Not seeing any hands. Moving on, um, the CPA forward planner at pages 37 to 38. Are there any questions on that? Again, not seeing any hands. And we have a national update. <coughs> have we got somebody? Oh, it's Richard. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thanks very much and good afternoon, everyone. Um, just a very um, uh, brief update uh, from me, uh, just to raise uh, two or three uh, points. Um, I think the first thing to say is just uh, um, it's good to be here in, in person. This is my uh, first uh, time uh, at the board uh, in in person, having attended by teams the last few meetings, and um, 
you know, really keen to uh, work with you all from a, a Scottish government um, perspective. And uh, certainly if there are uh, key matters and points that uh, need to be raised outside of the meeting, then then really happy to, to pick up on those points as, as well. Um, it, it feels like an awful long time ago now, but it was actually just over two weeks ago that the First Minister um, published her programme for government. Um, it was a much um, shorter document than in um, previous years, um, really reflecting the fact that this being the second year of um, the, the parliamentary term, a lot of the, the key uh, planks of the, the, the government's policy for, for the five years of, of, of this parliament were set out last year and an expectation that those uh, plans would, would, would continue. Um, but also, I think, reflecting the fact that she has a, a real focus uh, right now on on the cost crisis that we are are facing, and and really wanted the the the, the focus of that shorter document to be about the steps that the government um, in Scotland would be taking uh, around the, the the cost crisis. And I think I suppose one of the interesting things that, um, looking at the the papers for today is thinking through as well as a as a CPP what the what the impact might be on some of the immediate cost crisis pressures. Uh, that we're facing uh, in terms of the work that the the, the board uh, takes forward. Um, uh, following the um, the, the uh, program for government announcement, um, the deputy first minister uh, gave a, a statement to to parliament the following day, um, setting out some of the um, financial challenges that the uh, government is facing uh, in Scotland in in the current year in particular. Um, and looking at some of the, the, the steps and actions that will uh, need to be taken to, to meet some of the priorities around both pay and some of the wider cost considerations that were that were being taken uh, forward by, by government. Um, clearly today's events in, in, uh, in Westminster will be important and uh, you know a bit more to be done in terms of digesting uh, what all of that will mean, but um, the Deputy First Minister has committed um, to uh, a emergency budget review within two weeks of the statement today and clearly there will be um, interest in terms of the impact on that for, for the city here uh, in terms of what's what's announced. Um, a number of policy commitments as well within the program for government um, and uh, I suppose one that's that, that's key and we've talked about uh, here before um, is in relation to the, the National Care Service um, so as, as colleagues will know that the, the bill was laid uh, earlier this year um, and over the coming weeks um, committees within uh, Holyrood will be taking uh, evidence in relation to, to the National Care Service both uh, written and, and verbally and uh, there's likely to, to be a vote in terms of the next stage on the NCS uh, in the early part of, of 2023. Um, there is a stakeholder event that is uh, happening in Perth in early October, um, and uh, that will be a, a key meeting to 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 meet with a range of of um, uh, those involved in in taking forward plans, and again a really important uh, consideration in terms of the local approach here in Aberdeen uh, to to the NCS, and and clearly something that uh, I'll be keen to to engage with you all on further as as things uh, progress with that. But um, uh, they were just a kind of couple of key points that I wanted to flag, but very happy to take uh, any questions as well. Thank you very much for that. Questions, please. I'm not seeing any hands. You must have been very comprehensive. <laughs> oh, sorry, we've got Luanne. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Just just a question on, on the National Care Service and the co-design process that will be followed. I, I think that's obviously a really good approach to be involving people with lived experience um, at the centre of this work. I'm interested to understand how staff um, who are involved currently in health and, and social care delivery and also leaders around this agenda are also to be involved in the co-design process, because I think we all have lived experience that is relevant and hopefully helpful to, to help um, the National Care Service develop. I'm interested just to understand that, if you're able to answer that, Richard. Thank you. Yeah, so, um, uh, so I, I, I'm aware that the, that the policy team, as as you've said, Luanne, are, are, are really keen to get that uh, co-design, um, and and that is in, in as, as wide a sense as possible. 
So yes, it's absolutely um, for those that are users of social care services, but also um, uh, um, for, for for staff involved as as well. So um, you know, in terms of some of the detail of of, of that work, um, you know, I'm very happy to kind of set some of that out uh, more fully. Um, but for for, for those uh, for members to see that uh, in terms of that approach that's being proposed to be taken, as I say, there's a. Um, uh, uh, a, a national event happening on the the, th the third of, third of October uh, to discuss some of this in a bit more detail. And I think following that, the intention would be to set out in a bit more detail some of the approaches that will be taken in terms of that uh, uh, approach to co-design. So I'm um, very happy to kind of follow up on that point further. But certainly that's the the plan in terms of moving that forward. Thank you very much, Luan. Have you got any further questions? No, thank you. That's helpful. Thank you. Any other questions? I'm not seeing any hands on the screen. I'm not seeing anybody in the room. Well, thank you very much, Richard. That's very helpful. Thank you. Uh, moving on then, um, agenda item 2.1, locality plan annual reports. Um, I think we've got Lauren and Chris in the room. Um, yeah, Lauren, um, it's myself and Paul that's here today. Um, so, so this is the first annual report um, following the publication of the locality plans um, in July last year. Um, and although COVID has had a negative impact on many of the community activities, um, this report shows the work that's continued across localities over the last 12 months. Um, all the reporting on localities is combined into this one report, um, but these will be separated for circulation within each of the respective localities in an easy read version. Um, the easing of restrictions and the writing of this report um, has been an ideal opportunity for us to take stock, look at improving communication and engagement within localities. And at the end of the document, there's the locality planning refresh roadmap. Um, this has been developed to give a clear and systemat systematic approach to review, prioritise and plan based on action for change. Um, so we're looking for the, the report to be agreed at the meeting today, um, but happy to take any questions. Thank you. Any questions? Councillor MacDonald, thank you. Thank you, Chair, and, and thanks very much for um, a, a very comprehensive and, um, and, and quite a complex picture happening in, in, in the, the three different um, localities and, and the plans that, that sit behind them. My question, I guess, is more around um, the um, the last page and the the next steps and and the refresh road map that that we have in front of us. And it it was perhaps just to get an understanding on how that work is progressing. Um, obviously, this report in front of us is for a, a particular year, and but uh, and that's good to see. But it was just to to get a sense of. Um, of whether things are picking up in the localities, um, because there were some concerns around, um, you know, the the, um, the the local meetings and so on. So, if that was um, possible to get an update, would be great. Um, yes. Yeah, so the um, the 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 legs around the the legs role and remit. Um, we've done a survey with the legs. We've reviewed the membership. So. Um, we had, I think, 350 members and then we've gone out to all those members and checked that they still want to be part of the group. Um, I think we've got about 130 come back and say that they continue want to want to be part of that group. Um, so that's been undertaken. We've asked them about what they feel their role in remit is um, and we've shared with them the results of the survey and the workshops. Um, I don't know if you want to share Paul around the PNPs and how they're progressing with the the, local, the priorities within them? Yep, I mean, as part of the, the development of the plans, the, the locality plans just last year, uh, there was considerable uh, work undertaken in terms of consultation. Those community ideas are still there um, and uh, we're kind of prioritising those um, to take back to the next round of PNP meetings to look at how we, we begin to implement against those uh, those ideas that, that came forward at that time. Thanks. Um, and, and then just a, a very um, 
uh, small question, which you, you might not have the answer to, but um, certainly in, in, in the Aberdeen Central Place um, report, there was a mention of uh, bikes without lights and the uh, initiatives that are, are happening to um, make it more visible to um, other road users, but also to keep people safe on their bikes. And it was just to get a sense of if that um, is going to um, with in in partnership with the police to be extended as we particularly come into the um the winter months i think it's it's definitely um something that is picked up a lot in um in, in particularly in the center of town um about uh, too many bikes without lights i don't have the detail on that but i can certainly follow that up and uh, bring that back Thank you. Um, I've got Luan uh, online, please. Thanks. Um, well, firstly, just to say that the this uh, annual report was uh, endorsed by Aberdeen IJB just in its August meeting. So really support the work and it's great to see the, the progress that's happened um, over the last year. My question was also on the, the challenges about engaging members of the community in this work and I, w I wondered if there's been any plans or, or, or thinking around using social media, small stories that can be used from this report to bring to life um, what it means to be involved, um, which, you know, as a way of encouraging more engagement with community members, particularly young people. I would, I would say that any any ideas like that are really welcome um, and how we can engage more. Um, I know that last year, specifically around young people, there was a, a workshop that was undertaken around the legs to try and get um, partners around the table to think about how we could get more young people involved. Um, and I, I know that at the, at the CPA management um, group, um, there was a suggestion around making it real for people. So what are the priorities for people, cost of living? How do we get people involved in, in the, those things that are really, really important to them right now? So I think there's lots of different strands and lots of different ways that we can try and capture people's attention and get them involved in, in the and engaged in locality planning. Thank you for that. Any further questions? Luan, do you want to come back or is no? Thanks. OK, we have the recommendations are on page 40 that we are asked to approve the locality plan report 21-22 containing appendix one and to agree the publication circulation uh, of those to our partners and note that an easy read version will be produced. Can we agree the recommendations? Thank you. Um, 3.1, the CPA Improvement Programme Quarterly Report. Um, Mrs Swanson, do you want to take us through? Thanks, Chair. Members have the CPA Improvement Programme providing the overview of progress of the 75 improvement aims. Um, the report is highlighting that we have 10 improvement aims that have now been achieved. And last cycle, you approved three project end reports and you have a further three project end reports later on today's agenda for consideration. In terms of delivery of the programme, there are 20 improvement aims to be achieved by 2022 and four of those have been achieved. So we've 16 still to be achieved. In terms of overall, we have 11 projects showing a red ragging status. However, the management group at its last meeting discussed all of those projects to identify the issues impacting progress and any support required as detailed in the draft minute. And it's expected that progress will be reported at the next meeting. At Appendix 2, you have two case studies with the project managers here today to talk through the changes that they've tested, the outcomes they've achieved to date, as well as any barriers. And I'll pass on to both Angela shortly. Then finally, at Appendix 3, we have two um, new project charters there for the board's consideration and approval today. Subject to approval of those two charters, we'll then have 74 of our 75 aims live. And there is one outstanding charter that's due, and that's detailed at section um, page 78 of your pack. And that's in relation to the improvement aim regarding the number of children and young people with an eating disorder who are identified within three months of onset. 
The board had previously agreed to postpone that charter to enable the findings from the school health and wellbeing survey to be considered. But having reviewed existing data available, it's evident that the current improvement aim cannot be measured or achieved. Therefore, the charter has been postponed for further in-depth data on the current systems to be gathered with a revised aim to come to a future meeting of the management group and then the board. If there are any questions on appendices one and three, we'll take them now and then we're happy to pass over to the two project managers in attendance for the case studies chair. Thank you very much for that. And I think really the stats speak for themselves in terms of the successes uh, that are ongoing. But quick questions, first of all, for Mrs Swanson, uh, Councillor MacDonald. Uh, just a, a, a couple of things, Chair. Um, uh, on page 81, um, just with the, the, the big picture overview, um, I was kind of struck that, you know, half of, of what we're trying to do, either um, we have no data or we only have baseline data. And, uh, and I, I'm sure that that will start, those, those different colours will start to, um, to change over time. But um, I, I, I just wanted to really flag up whether that was a, a concern or not, um, um, given given that bar chart, and 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 I guess the the one alongside it in terms of live projects, um, again shows you know we're, that we're, we're we're getting through things, but 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 there's still quite a lot of of work to do. And my third point was really around that um, charter that we haven't started yet, um, and. I just wondered if we could be a bit more specific about when, as a board, we would want to see that um, kicked off and, and you know, going both to the um, to the CPA um, team and then and then and then coming here because I, I wasn't comfortable. I think with just having this open ended um, 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 data in the future. I think um, particularly coming out of COVID and. And 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 I don't know if it's particularly girls, but um, eating disorder is definitely um, quite high up on the agenda now. And I think, um, as a board, that we would want to um, definitely see some of that work progressing. But I take on board that there are uh, issues around some of that baseline data. Thanks, councillor. In terms of the data question, um, absolutely are working with the, those project teams where the baseline data is still to be established and that is ongoing and we would hope that for the next reporting period we would be in a position where the majority will now have that in place. Where they only have baseline data in place, we are satisfied that they do have a mechanism in place to gather that data and it will come forward. So there is a system in place for those, so less concerned in regard of those. In relation to the outstanding charter in terms of eating disorders, um, the intention would be that there is a Children's Services Board meeting next week. I think Mr Simpson's nodding and that an update will be provided and it will be considered at that point with the hope that it will then be able to go to the management group meeting in October and then here to the board and think the meeting is either at the end of October or November. But Mr Simpson, you're, do you want to come in? Thank you, Chair, if that's OK. I think the challenge within this charter has been to distinguish what is an eating disorder and what is disordered eating. The two are not the same things and actually trying to extrapolate between the two is, is really quite tricky and, and, and challenging. But that, that's the sort of the, the, the real um, acorn that we're trying to really grapple with around it. You're right, the data coming out of COVID is predominantly suggesting that eating disorders or disordered eating has affected girls more than it has boys um, and, and that's something that we are, we are aware of um, around that but it's also recognizing when we're taking a really early and preventative lens to this that actually a, a, an eating disorder is, is a it's a psychological diagnosis and, and that actually so we need to sort of take that into account in terms of our thinking and how do we bring a preventative lens to actually ensure that other indicators of disordered eating are being picked up early and, and being responded to. It's also got linkages to some of the other um, charters that we've, we're, we're, we're going to come on to speak about later. Um, but but nonetheless, it's about how do we really ensure that, that we are ensuring that, that lens up that on a preventative basis. Hope that's helpful, councillor. Thank you very much for that. 
Any further questions at this point? I'm not seeing any hands in the room or on the screen. So in that case, can we take us to the part of the report 1.6 dealing with the un uptake of unclaimed benefits? Uh, Angela, do you want to take us through that? Thanks. Yes, um, thank you for inviting me along to speak about uh, my project. Um, I'm happy to say we've actually achieved the, the aim and I've started working on the kind of end report. But I'll just give you a little bit more detail um, about some of the um, changes we've been testing out. So the first one was the online benefit calculator that we launched. Um, and you'll see from some of the data there, you know, we've had a, a great outturn there of you know, 222,573 of weekly benefits new identified. Obviously the caveat is it doesn't tell us if they actually go on to claim the benefit, but it does give us a good idea um, that they are um, checking. Um, we've done a few different tests. We've done through social media to highlight the online benefit calculator. We've been contacting, putting out through newsletters and also through the educations group call messaging system, you know, highlighting this just to constantly get people to be checking um, what they're entitled to. Um, and we're just about to um, put a QR code um, on our rent arrears letters. Um, so when they're going out again, encouraging tenants who may have fallen into rent arrears to check if they're entitled to a top up of benefit to help manage those rent arrears a little bit better. So again, just looking at all different ways that we can um, promote it, um, but it's worked really, really well. Um, the other bit that we did was a targeted take up campaign, and that was using um, the data that the council already had access to, um, and that was around uh, pension credits. Um, so we took data from housing benefit and council tax reduction. Um, we did manual calculations um, to identify those um, that were missing out. Um, and we did initially start off doing telephone calls, um, but unfortunately, well, no, actually quite rightly, they thought this might have been a scam. So we then changed our stance and sent them out letters confirming how much they would be entitled to, um, giving them different ways that they could claim. And then obviously our contact details if they wanted assistance to, to kind of claim that. But that was quite astonishing. Um, eight, well, just almost um, 900,000 annually that was identified that people um, were missing out on. So hopefully they have claimed it. We are going to start um, calling them back um, to find out if they did claim it. Um, unfortunately, there's a massive delay with pension credits processing claims. So we've had to kind of delay that part of the kind of project, but testing that out. But we found it worked really well. Um, and the next kind of targeting we're doing is um, around the educational benefits that the council administer. Um, so that's the free school meals, the clothing grants and EMAs, educational maintenance allowance. Sorry, I use a lot of abbreviations. It's just what I'm used to. Um, so we part of that, well, one of it's just completed. We've merged the free school meals and clothing grant application. Um, we were looking at data back in March and it showed there was almost about a thousand of a difference. So there was a thousand more children getting free school meals than they were clothing grant and it's very similar eligibility. And we thought, well, they're missing out. And we were going to try and see what we could do about that. But one of the um, kind of tasks was merging the claim form. So they're only doing one claim, so should always get if they're entitled to it. We have a dashboard being built at the moment is going to extract the data of the free school meals and clothing grant and then to look at identifying those that could be eligible for education maintenance allowance because so again that was a benefit we found was quite low take up 277 um, when we took the data in march and we will be doing a targeted benefit take up campaign for for that benefit as well um the kind of final um test that we did was around a support for families booklet um, so that went out and we then put out a feedback questionnaire um, to the families and we got some really good feedback that the you know 90% found it useful. But one of the feedback they did give was they would like it more regular. Um, so I'm just updating the booklet for with the new uprating figures for the benefits. But the plan will also to be to put out regular updates, but more bite size as well. 
Um, so, for example, we've got the expansion of the Scottish Child Payment coming up in November. So we'll make sure that all the kind of families are aware of that um, and can do that theme running out throughout the months to make sure that all the families are, you know, claiming what they're entitled to, especially at this current economic um, crisis. So, yeah, it's um, been really, really good. Um, but for me, it's business as usual. This is my day job, the job that I love doing, me and my team. And, um, you know, we'll keep um, making sure that everyone gets what they're entitled to. So thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, can, I, can I just say I, I found this a really fascinating a piece of work um, and, and I think it's a really valuable piece of work especially as you say we're in an economic crisis uh, and everything we can do to help people to essentially claim what they're entitled to at the end of the day I think is absolutely key uh, and I must admit um, I, I actually only yesterday received a message on my phone which was a scam um, ask, advising me that I could claim all sorts of things, uh, sadly because of my age, but uh, there you go. Um, but uh, it, it's pretty bad that people actually try and take advantage of these situations. But have we got any questions for Angela? Uh, Councillor Radley. Thank you, Convener. I've just got a couple if that's OK. Um, with regards to sort of pension credits where people maybe aren't claiming pension credits, are you, you and your service um, highlighting other things that they might be entitled to? I'm thinking of like TV licence and things like that at the same time. Yeah, sorry, that was also included in the letter that we sent out to them was the entitlement based on what we'd worked out and other passported benefits that they may be entitled to. So yeah, that was all part of the letter. And as I say, we do plan... Well, we can check whether they've claimed it because that should show in their housing benefit and council tax reduction claim. And if they've not, we do plan to phone them. But due to the delays in pension credit processing their claims, we've kind of delayed that a little bit to give that time um, to be processed before we start phoning them to say, well, why did you claim? Why not? Sort of thing. But it was quite surprising. We had one woman, well, it was our daughter phoned up. And even though her mum could be entitled, the daughter said no. Um, my daughter said not to bother claiming and it was really quite sad to kind of but it's something you're entitled to but unfortunately older people do tend not to want to claim these things um, but I mean hopefully I know it sounds awful but you know with the cost of living they might be but it's a good thing because they are entitled to it and they should be getting it because then you've got the automatic entitlement to warm home discount scheme when you get pension credits and yeah, there's a lot of sort of surrounding benefits that come from claiming pension credit. So, you know, thank you for your work. Um, my next question is around um, free school meals and the clothing grant sort of joint application. Obviously, for primaries one to five, we've got um, universal free school meals now. Are you finding that you're having to target sort of the clothing grant more or is that sort of scheme bringing more people to your service to say, is there anything else I can get? Am I entitled to? Um, we still do get a uh, lots of applications from P1 to P5 because the free school meals has been linked to the Scottish child bridging payment. So that was um, Scottish government gave funding um, to kind of cover the the six and above that weren't able to get the, the Scottish child payment. So to get that um, for well. <clears throat> Yeah, it's four or five, six, six payments. It was in total. It will be, um, you had to be claiming free school meals for low income entitlement. So we haven't seen that drop down. As I say, it was free school meals that had the highest um, children claiming, and it was the clothing grant that had almost a thousand less. Um, but as I say, we've now merged the the kind of two applications into one, so that shouldn't happen going forward. And then we're getting our dashboard. It's almost finished, um, where we can then start looking at again who's missing out. Um, and because we've all have the data already, then we can just auto award and vice versa if we find the guilt clothing grant but not free school meals because I think one of the areas is round about um, secondary school. They they don't want to be claiming free school meals. Um, but we did highlight some of the benefits as you get your vouchers in the summertime, the the supermarket vouchers and obviously the bridging payments. So. Yeah, I forgot my third question, so I'll maybe let Councillor McDonald come in. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, I, I wanted to ask around um, at a recent community council meeting, 
one of the community councillors um, was pointing out that it was it's quite a, a complex um, landscape of benefits and and just with the cost of living crisis and all the different other streams that are available to people, there is just this um, quite fuzzy um, mapping um, at, at the moment. And she was asking, is there anything anywhere that can, we can go on our website or, or anywhere just to get a, a, a big picture so that when she's speaking to um, people in the community that she can signpost them quite quickly to somewhere to go. Now, I don't, I'm, you know, I, I don't know if that's even um, possible, um, but it's definitely something that there is more of a, 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 an ask and, and a need for. And I guess the other side of it is how can we better use our comms, but also, um, you know, our, our um, um, you know, the the um, the press and the media to 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 really get a, a, a lot of what what you know your your team are, are are doing an excellent job, but it's just making that a, a wider um, knowledge, whether it's through social media or or traditional um, media ways, and and uh, and whether that can be built on. Yes, thank you. Um, yes, on the council's website, we have our own page and we've got links to the individual benefits. There is a specific cost of living page as well. Um, and then obviously that has our contact details, because um, as you say, the, the benefit system is not straightforward. It is very complex um, and that's why we're here to kind of help people navigate. Um, you know, the benefit calculator is great, but obviously it has its limitations and it has to be for people that are um, digitally able to, to use it. Um, but what it does do is it frees up my staff's time to focus on those that are more kind of complex that need that um, kind of supporting um, role through exactly what they can and can't claim and, and assistance to claim those benefits as well. Thank you very much. Councillor Radley, did you say you wanted to come back in? Thanks. I can't remember what my last question is, so I'll maybe follow up after with yourself, if that's OK. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Chief Exec, thanks. Thank you, Councillor Nicola. Angela, well done. This is a great piece of, of work. I think we'd all commend you for, for it. I'm just curious about what partners can do to promote the calculator. So. We invest hugely in the health and social care around social prescribing, link workers and so on. So could you maybe just say a bit about bit, bit that? And then I noticed it's lovely we kind of comment on the charter about the impact that it had. But again, just thinking about building on Councillor Radley and Councillor McDonald's points about the school websites, the school newsletters, the group calls that we do to school, because I guess that we are facing some pretty sharp um, circumstance over the next few weeks. So I think it's just about how we really step up in tens. And you've got some really lovely stories. There would be great to put those stories on website and media and start to really push about actually the, 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 the income that is available here, if you know what you're entitled to. So can you maybe just say a wee bit around what partners can do to help promote the, the tool? Yeah, I mean, I've already started speaking with partners and going out to communities um, and promoting the, the online benefit calculator. So it is just for everyone to kind of promote it through their social media. The schools already do it through their pages and their kind of um, communications out to kind of pupils. But yeah, I mean, I'm happy to look at any way that can get the message out. Um, we've got some great stories. Um, you know, it's... Yeah, you can really make a difference. I was just speaking to a, a gentleman who got referred to us from Scottish Welfare Fund. He just turned um, state pension age last week and his, he thought his income had reduced and he's got mental health um, um, issues anyhow. And he was really upset as the message that we got from Scottish Welfare Fund. But we had a quick look and just gave him a phone and he's missing out on pension credit. Um, about £52 and he's like but someone told me I wouldn't get it and it's like but you've got a premium you're missing out on because of your PIP so just did the claim there and then for pension credits and he was just absolutely delighted um, and stuff because he just thought my income had gone down where that's not the case when you get to pension age you normally get a lot more money and then I was telling him about the other kind of benefits you'll get with the warm home discount scheme and you should be getting is £150 and he's just so happy um, and you know we've got plenty of these kind of cases 
you know, I love my job. Um, it's, yeah, love it, making a difference. Um, so yeah, we've got lots of things that we could be sharing. Um, the one thing I did, I don't know if you've noticed it as well, but um, the the media used to kind of kind of target benefit claimants as a kind of bad thing, but I think with COVID there has been a change in society, and it's like all the newspapers are now promoting the benefits, um, personal independence payment, that sort of thing. So I think there has been a change in attitude. Um, so that's a positive thing, and you do see in the papers um, that they're promoting it. But if Evening Express wants to start doing something locally, I'd be glad and be happy to provide some information for that. Thanks. I wonder, I wonder if we should take a, an action then around trying to, um, particularly in light of, of crisis and cost of living, a whole CPP campaign and individual and just see if we can really capture all of all of that. Thank you very much. I, I would very much agree with that. I think that's an excellent idea. Um, before I take you back in, Councillor Radley, I've got Yvonne on the uh, internet. Thanks. Thank you very much and good afternoon, everyone. This is my first meeting of the board. Um, having joined, um, I am the Head of Operations for North East for Skills Development Scotland following Gordon McDougall's retirement. So um, lovely to be here. I just wanted to say I, I thought this is a really excellent piece of work and I wondered how um, well linked we are in with DWP and the Scottish Social Security um, around waiting times and the work that, that Angela, I think, um, you're doing there. That was my one question. The second point was, um, I'm not sure if you've linked locally in with the Career Centre, um, and we would certainly want to hear more about that. So you've maybe already done that and just not cited on it as yet. I will be soon. Um, and the other point I was just going to make was around the Cash First pilots, and are we considering that approach for um, Aberdeen? Thank you. Hi, yes, we, we do have good relationships with DWP and the Scottish Social Security Agency. We have, um, they attend um, our meetings. We host an Aberdeen City and Shire Advisor Forum. But, you know, if there are certain cases that we're having problems with, we can escalate them to get them resolved. Um, it's, an, it's a national issue with the pension service. But I think things are changing because, again, we had another client just the other week um, we advised on pension credits and she got a letter the week later. So hopefully that has been resolved um, on that side of thing. Um, I'm not I'm pretty sure if we have reached out to you yet about our um, benefit calculator. Yeah. Happy to do mm -hmm. so. Um, we do now seem to be getting a lot more invites to events, in-person events, which is always great um, to get out and about again. Um, so happy to, to look at um, something um, on that. And sorry, I missed forgotten your last point that's question. okay um uh, three three for one <laughs> it was a cash a cash first i've yeah. been reading this in different areas that i'm, I'm covering so i just want to yeah i believe our aberdeen citizens vice bureau have started that um but we also uh, my service has access to um food and fuel vouchers um and that's when you know they've started working with ourselves um and you know to get the advice and kind of um, improve their situation, we can give them a quick access to that because I do appreciate, yes, we've got loads of food banks, but it's better giving them the choice because um, I really appreciate that kind of um, way of thinking. Um, but I think it's our local Citizens Advice Bureau that's piloting that at the moment. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Councillor Radley. Thank you, convener. It was just going back to Miss Scott's um, sort of how we can advertise the services that you provide and, you know, the uptake and the positive message that comes out of your service. Um, we also have a, a network of 45 councillors um, who are very well linked in or should be very well linked in with their communities. Um, and it's whether there's something that we can do as a council um, to promote that. But also um, we've got the SHMU community newspapers um, and, and I know a number of our community councils, um, myself and Alex, um, 
have their own newsletters and Facebook pages and things like that. And it's whether there's something perhaps we can do in, in that sort of sphere because they are, you know, community based and they go out free to the community. So it is, you know, potentially free advertising for a service that is very good at what they do. Thank you. And yeah, I mean, I say we're planning on doing specific bite size for kind of families. We could be sharing that bite size throughout all the networks um, and then maybe focusing on a benefit a month um, rather than a whole booklet, because sometimes it is a bit, oh, my goodness. Um, and that way, with that focus on certain benefits, it might just get people thinking. So, yeah, happy to look at any kind of way. Um, as I say, we have done social media and that does seem to work. And it is better when you focus on one benefit. Um, so, yeah, really happy to pass on it, it, the information. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we did have a hand up. Um, oh. So, there we go. Hi, thank you. Um, and it's just to, in response to um, Angela's question, really happy to ensure that uh, both within making every opportunity count, but our income maximisation pathways that we connect these in. So uh, I will go back and, and make sure we are within the NHS. I, I guess the second area of work that we are taking forward um, with our academic partners around the creative campus and um, storytelling for change. So again, um, happy to connect in with you around that to see if we can use some of those stories to de-stigmatise actually using the calculator in the first place. Thanks. Thank you very much for that. Any more questions? I think we've covered this one uh, very, very well uh, and I think we're all very supportive uh, of the work that's been done here. Uh, so Perhaps, Angela, when you go back to your team, you can pass on our thanks. Um, I, I think everybody in the room really does appreciate the work that your team have been doing. Um, if we could then move on and we could hear from uh, the other Angela, please, uh, on supporting care experience young people progressing to employment. Thanks. There's never too many Angelas. Um, thank you for inviting me along today. Um, I might go around in circles a little bit with us, but I'll ask you to bear with me and it's just due to the nature of um, what we do. Um, I was asked to lead a project to support a number of care experienced young people into employment. Um, and I've got to say my heart initially sank because sometimes, the, and I'm saying sometimes because I know Mr Simpson will tell me off otherwise, sometimes our care experienced young people have got a really wide range of challenges. And sometimes it's very, very hard to get them ready to engage in employability support because they've got to overcome so many barriers just to be at that point. And I say sometimes because that's not always true. Some of our, our care experienced youngsters are absolutely solid. They know where they want to go and they know how to get there. Um, the target of 15 doesn't seem terribly high in the grand scheme of things. Um, the young people that we've worked with have all had significant challenges to, to get into employment. I, I should say as well, while I lead the employability and skills team and the, the ultimate goal is employment, um, we speak about positive destinations. So my team are always gearing towards a positive destination with employment as the, the sort of golden bit at the end, that, that pot at the end of the rainbow. A positive destination is engaging in training, in volunteering, in going on to education, so that could be college or university, it could be employment and it could be any type of employment, self-employed, apprenticeship, um, normal, say a normal job, just a job. Um, it was clear at the outset that this needed a significant number of partners involved, um, social work and youth social work being absolutely key, Skills Development Scotland, my team and education. Um, and we also needed an external partner to really get into the guts of what was required and to be able to bend and flex and be very, very responsive to the needs of our young people. Um, the majority of the young people that we've had on the books through this programme have been young men. We have got a, a couple of young women as well. And the, the case study that we gave you um, about the wonderful blue haired Becca is probably one of my my favourites out of all the work that we've done, not just for care experienced young people. Um, we started 
actually really with the basics of looking at what what's getting in the road for our youngsters because they might not just have you know a bit of nervousness a bit of anxiety a bit of social isolation they might have housing issues they may have serious challenges with their families if they have a family at all they might have mental health issues they may have trauma in their lives that you know there's so much more that may be um affecting these young people so while we were sitting down looking at what could we do we got an approach from an organization called working right which wanted to um pilot some activity um and it was really intensive employability support for care experienced young people they'd done some research they'd taken the views of young people into that research and from that had <laughs> built up what they saw as a programme that would fit care experience young people. So we met with them and with social work colleagues. We knocked it into shape for what we thought would work for Aberdeen and crucially what would work for our funding. Um, a young person guarantee came just at the right time to enable us to, to do this. Um, so we, we agreed to pilot um, and we branded it Rightworks, which is a mashup of Working Right and ABZ Works, which is how we brand the, the Employability and Skills team. That project saw one of my employability key workers team up with a key worker from Rightworks who would be the main contact for our care experienced young people. They could be referred into us through a variety of routes, including self referral, through Skills Development Scotland's careers advisors, and um, they could come from education and they could come from Skills Development Scotland Health Services, as long as they fit the criteria, which is basically that they live in Aberdeen and they're not in employment or education, as in uh, further or higher education, we could work with them. Um, so that that RightWorks programme is one of a number of different things that we did. Um, COVID, of course, came and bit us at the same time as we were trying to get that off the ground. So what was meant to be a one year pilot landed up in a two year pilot. But we learned an awful lot from that. And one of the things that we learned is our young people are actually an awful lot more resilient than many of us gave them credit for. They were very keen to progress. And while the digital engagement wasn't brilliant, we kitted them all out with Chromebooks. We kitted them all out with a dongle so they could get online not only to do the boarding stuff, but also to do gaming or watch movies or you know whatever it was they wanted to do to keep them happy. Um, working right through the RightWorks programme delivered some online training, certified, um, accredited, I'll say that's easier, accredited training for them. Um, and as things started to open up just a little bit, they started to meet young people and go for a walk with them. So they were getting proper engagement, not just talking to a face over a screen, which we will all know that gets pretty tiring pretty quickly. Um, we picked up very quickly that isolation was starting to impact upon them. We picked up quite quickly that mental health was suffering mm -hmm. um, in one instance. And, and I think that this really shows the strength of the project with a young chap who he'd just moved out of a care home, children's home. He was just in his own flat. His relationship with his girlfriend broke down and he decided he was, he'd had enough. He didn't want to continue with life. He confided this to Liam, his, his um, working right key worker, who immediately came to us. We immediately called in social work, had a conversation, put all the necessary safeguards around this young person and also very gently, carefully dangled some carrots to try to pull them out, to get them to engage, to get them back onto a, a more even track, being very careful not to appear to be rewarding him for having very dangerous thoughts. Um, he's doing fine now. He's doing really well now. He's he's back on that even keel. He's engaging brilliantly. Um, through RightWorks, we've seen a, a number of young people go on to, um, it's almost it's not quite work experience, it's it's a work taster, but they get some training allowance for it. It's amazing how well they engage when they get some money in their pockets and quite rightly too. Um, almost all of those young people went on to secure jobs with the people who provided the placements for them. A um, couple have withdrawn, but employability services, as I said at the start, are not always at the right time for somebody. Sometimes they're just not ready or they have a bump in the road and they need to back off. So we leave that door open 
they can come back to us. Um, Rightworks is ongoing. It's been so successful that we have extended their contract again through our, our young person guarantee funding um, and that is continuing really well and we've got obviously the regular meetings with the working right managers with our um, youth social work team with skills development Scotland and with our virtual head teacher that takes me on to the next bit because that little initial piece of steering group led us to understand internally within the council actually these conversations between employability and skills, SDS, virtual head teacher, social work. It's a really good way to look at what's coming up, what are we learning, um, where are the barriers, what can we do jointly, how can we share information. So the teams have upskilled, but the relationships, which they were always there before, they're now much stronger than they ever were. So if something comes up, if anybody's got an issue, we all know whose door to chap on, and we do that quite regularly. Um, we put in place pathway planning meetings in schools for young people who were at risk of leaving secondary education without a positive destination. That wasn't specifically for care experienced young people, but obviously our, our care experienced youngsters were high on the priority list for that. That's worked out really well because it means that these youngsters are not leaving school to then slip into a void, you know, hanging around the back of the shops, drinking, smoking, whatever they do at 15 and 16, which was a long time ago for me. Um, but they've got a contact, they've got a key worker, they've got a link, they've got ideas, they know where they can go and they know they've got support. Uh, and that's working really well between um, ourselves and particularly with the Skills Development Scotland Careers Advisors. We've been promoting support available to our key experienced youngsters in terms of employability support across a range of channels. We particularly use the social work youth team for that. They're right in amongst the, these, these young people. I had the pleasure of being invited to a supper club meeting of the Champions Board way back when, um, and that one's just come back to, to bite me because they want us back again, which is fantastic. Um, but just that conversation with some care experienced youngsters actually opened their eyes to what is out there that they didn't know was there before and has has brought in some um, engagement. We've, I say we, it was our people and organisational development colleagues introduced a guaranteed interview scheme for care experienced young people. Um, and that's to encourage and support them to secure employment within the authority. And it's a tricky one because sometimes like the, the um, disabled guaranteed interview scheme, people sometimes think if I tick that box, it's highlighting me and it's a bad thing, so I'm not going to fess up to being who I am. So there's a bit of work being ongoing to encourage people to tick it because actually it gives you a foot nearer the door than putting you back the way. And sometimes that takes a bit of convincing. For our, for our care experience, young people, our people and organisational development colleagues lay on special um, sessions to help young people understand what working in the council is about, how the interview process works. Um, they will do interview training with them. Our key workers will do the same if we've got a care experienced young person on the book. We do mock interviews, we do confidence building, all these things to really get them ready to go. We've also got a wee hardship fund which we have available to all clients but I'm always very encouraging of the team to promote to our care experienced young people who don't have that bank of mum and dad. So do you need a suit for your interview? Do you need a new pair of shoes? Do you need a haircut? Do you need a new lipstick? All that kind of stuff that just boosts you up a wee bit um, ahead of the interview. Um, that That's a small part of it. I could probably talk to you all day about what we've done. I suppose the, the big mess, and I touched on that at the start, um, our, our blue haired, blue -haired Becca, she came into us through the Kickstart scheme, which was a, a DWP scheme, which provided six 26 weeks of paid work experience for young people. Um, we've actually just won an award as an authority for the, excuse me, for the work that we did through Kickstart. We supported hundreds of young people into employment, a significant number within the authority, but also an awful lot out with. Um, unfortunately, we can't get numbers for how many of them are care experienced because the DWP doesn't record it, we had to hope to track through there. And the guaranteed interview scheme within the council, while it's brilliant, there's not a guarantee that they'll tick that guarantee box. 
and out with with all the other employers we just don't know so we try to engage and we try to pick up but that's something with the best will in the world we are we're never going to capture um i guess to close what i would say is this has been a really really rewarding project you always get a buzz when somebody moves on does something great gets a job this one particularly because some of the difficulties that our, our youngsters have had is really good and you see it in the key workers when they say oh so and so got a job yes they've got into college yes they've got an interview that's brilliant what do we need to do um so like angela k there said i love my job too and the the, the feel good bit you get out of it we are making a difference um this one to me as i said i was dreading it when it landed but i think we actually shaped up something really nice from it so that's that thank you very much for that um and and, and i do find these um case studies actually fascinating because it does show the resilience of young people uh, in our society and and it's you know a really good news story i think i i actually have a question in around work placements and people who find employment or, or who you manage to take into employment and and it maybe covers some of our partner organizations as well because i think you covered it yourself getting that first wage packet is oh so important but i remember when i started out my work journey it was how am i going to pay my bus fares how am i going to pay for something to eat uh, at lunchtime or if you are working a, a late shift um you know how how do we support people um in that situation and also to, to then learn to, to manage that that money that, that they are then getting because i i know when i was a young person it was a while ago but it was exactly the same uh, as i'm sure young people today i want to go and blow it on x or y um now while the the product may have changed slightly i think there is that great temptation when you get the the actual pace pack it into your hand and i just wonder if if there are any support mechanisms in place that really try and help people through that difficult stage uh, going from not really having an awful lot to suddenly having what outwardly is is quite a lot uh, when you're not used to it i wonder if you can give us some commentary around that sure so um we're very good at asking the dwp to put their hands in their pockets so where somebody's entitled to benefits if they're going into work then the dwp can cover for example the first month of bus fares um they can sometimes provide clothes for interview and um, they can sometimes cover the first wee bit of childcare costs so we'll smile sweetly at them first to make sure that that's in place for those who are eligible um the other, other Angela can tell you that my team quite regularly send people to her team to get financial advice and to try and understand that budgeting piece. Um, we have in the past used Money Advice Scotland, which has some free online modules, so we'll support people to use that. And the key workers will talk to particularly our younger participants about here's how you manage your money. And um, back when I was at school, I had a part-time job I got my pay every Saturday and then I went off to uni still got my pay every Saturday and then I came into the real world and I got paid every month and what a shock that was stretching through so we do talk to our um all of our participants about doing that um we do have a hardship fund that we've, we've hived off some of our employability funding so that if DWP can't act quickly enough to give somebody funds for clothing etc um, and we are increasingly seeing that somebody applies for a job and a few days later they're told to come in for an interview. That's too quick for DWP. We've purchased some Aberdeen gift cards, so we will dish them out carefully um, to our employability programme participants so they can go and buy their clothes or whatever else it is they need to get their hair cut in Aberdeen. So the money's coming back into the economy, but it's got them set up to go and do what they need to do. Um, the new um, travel scheme for under 22s, we seek to ensure that all our young people are signed up to that. So they've got free bus travel. That sometimes takes a while to come through. So if they don't have that, then we will buy them a bus ticket or a bus pass. 
um, tend to do that digitally now because they're less likely to lose their phone than they are to lose a bit of paper because these phones are precious. Um, so we, we do that with them. Um, and really just we try to join up all the dots with the, um, the support doesn't stop when somebody gets into a positive destination. Our key workers stay in touch with them so quite regularly for the first month and then they have check in points. It's four weeks, 13 weeks, 26 weeks, 52 weeks. They're checking in. Everybody is told if you have had enough of us, that's OK. But if you need us, you come and get us, you talk to us and we keep that link ongoing all the time until they're, you know, the 52 weeks by then they, they should be safe. Um, we have just as of the 31st of August been given a um, pot of money to support lone parents who are moving into employment to um, overcome some of those financial barriers that you mentioned. And again, we'll look to the DWP first so that we're getting the best bang for the buck and we can make it go as far as possible just to try and address any of those issues that may come up. Thank you very much for that. That was really helpful. Um, questions? Councillor MacDonald, thanks. Oh, what a fascinating story! Just um, 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 from 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 both um, from both Angela's, and um, I guess my my question is twofold. One is: Is there any um, peer to peer interaction with any of the young people that that you work with? Um, um, you know, or, or do they tend just to be? You're working with one and 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 all the, the the different agencies, or or is there any um um do they get to know each other? I guess is 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 one thing. The other the other question is around um those employers that that do take um our our young people, and and I know having another hat on when I was on the board of Langston Housing, for example, they had a very good um program at that time. Where um, they worked with, um, and I don't know if it was care, care um, uh, experience young people or whether it was it was just young people generally, but to get or or, or even older people to get them into um, employability. So it's really just to find out um, a, a bit more about those employers. Are do they tend to be third sector um, or or um, partners or, or or is it out into the private sector as well that 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 um, you work with uh, in your in your project? Um, I'll start with the peer to peer group work one to one. Um, we always start one to one because we need to get to know the, the young person, well, everybody that we work with, we need to get to know them. Um, so we start one to one and we try where appropriate to move them into group work um, with the the right words project, something we worked out very quickly early doors was we need to be cognizant of who's there and should we mix them up should we not um, so we took advice from our, our social work colleagues on that so um, one young gentleman that we were supporting had a number of orders against him for a particular type of offending which meant he could not be around females unaccompanied so um, he could have been locked up had we not known that and had we inadvertently put them in amongst um, a group with, with young women. So we have to be a bit careful there. There's also sometimes, and I'm just going to look to Mr Simpson for agreement on this in case I'm telling you a wee story. Sometimes, depending on the background, it's best to keep some of our care experienced young people apart so that you're not in good, so that we're not um, putting them back into a situation which may not be ideal for them. But that, that's fairly unusual. So generally, we'll start one to one. We'll get to know them. We we'll start to build them up. And then we will, where appropriate, move them into to group work sessions because that's part of getting to know the, the real world um, and real people. And it's not only care experienced young people that we're mixing them with. It's, it's everybody. Um, Employment wise, we play with everyone. So it's the whole gang. Um, we've got obviously partner agencies, third sector. They're always very keen to support. They tend not to have jobs in the same way, but in terms of training, they're always very, very keen to support. Um, the council has, as well every other public sector organisation, community benefits requirements attached to our major contracts. And through those, we can um, secure work experience placements, sometimes secure jobs. 
Um, so we, we basically use and abuse everywhere that we can to support people into work. Sometimes our young people will go into work with an employer that we've had absolutely no contact with, which is great because if they agree that we can liaise with the contract, the, the employer rather, that opens up another door potentially for another person coming through the programmes and, and it just self-perpetuates itself. Thank you very much for that. I've got uh, two people on Teams, Yvonne first and then Luan. Thanks. Hi there, sorry. I just had to move. Sorry, I hope you can hear me okay. Um, no, I think it's, this is a, a really, again, another really important piece of work. And as corporate parents, I think we, we need to be excited on it. And I just wondered the plans for scaling up. Potentially, we know that um, obviously we do have a gap of, uh, in outcomes for young people who have experience of care. Um, and I just wondered if there were plans to kind of scale this project up further. Um, I think you referenced the small numbers at the start, which is, you know, um, absolutely um, given the, the, the service size. But is there more we could be doing? That's my question. Um, I'm going to tell you that what we're doing now is effectively become business as normal. Um, so. If anybody comes to the door who fits the eligibility criteria for the funding, which all of our care experienced young people will, um, we will take them in um, and we will put them to whichever agency best fits their needs. Now, to date, it's generally been um, the Right Works project with Working Right, um, but not always. We, we did have one young guy who I didn't mention him earlier. We provided some seed funding to and worked with Business Gateway to help him set up his own business. Um, we take a, it's a person centred approach, which is a term that's bandied about quite a lot these days, but it is very much who are you, what do you need, what are your barriers, how do we get you there? Um, our key workers are now very experienced in because um, they've learned through the Right Works project what are the additional barriers and who are the people within the authority and partner agencies to, to speak to. Um, I couldn't tell you hand on heart how many care experienced young people we've got on the books right now. Um, and it does tend to, it almost flows with the school term and kids leaving school. Um, but we do have older ones who will come back to us. There's still, I think, a bit of learning ongoing because some care experienced young people will think I'll never get a job, I'll never hold down a job, I'm not ready for it. So that work carries on. But again, it's it's been incorporated into business as normal. Thank you for that. Luan? Thank you. Yvonne partly answered, uh, asked my question, it was, it was, which was about scale up. I, I see this work has been really important for how we prevent people developing adults who have problems with alcohol and drugs and all other sorts of things. So really important that we do more of this to help potentially vulnerable young people find their path and find their, their purpose. Uh, just from Chair of Aberdeen IJB, Angela, I just wanted to check that you've got the right connections into Aberdeen Health and Social Care Partnership to look at how we might offer placements for, for young folk. I am speaking with poor Sandy Reid on an almost weekly basis just now on a, a range of things. So I, I think I've got the right one, but um, if not, please point me towards somebody else. No, Sandy's the right person. That's good. Thank you. Okay, th thank you, uh, Mrs. Scott. I'll, I'll, I'll not have Angela again because we're, like we're, we're running out of Angela. Three Angelas. <laughs> it's been lovely to watch the other two Angelas. Absolutely share your passion for for what you're doing. So thank you for for doing that. I guess just in terms of if we're now normalising this. So normally in terms of our improvement practice, we would have this as a test of change. And then we would move to the kind of scale up and the deliberate plan. But it sounded like in response to Vaughan, you're just saying we're now just cracking on and doing it, which is terrific. Where does the community plan and partnership then see that you're sustaining this level of outcome? And you might want to call a friend, Mr Simpson or Mr Murchie might be able to answer in terms of the local outcome improvement and the outcome framework where the data 
will be reported that we are sustaining the outcomes that Yvonne's rightly challenging you on. But feel free to phone a friend, Angela, if you, if you want to. I will phone a friend, but before I do, um, this is a bit boring, so apologies. There's been a number of changes to the, the employability landscape in Scotland um, over the past wee while with the introduction of something called No One Left Behind um, and the Young Person Guarantee will be incorporated into No One Left Behind. But one of the things that that's seen is the establishment of local employability partnerships in Aberdeen. I've got the um, honour of, of chairing that and Nicola Graham from Skills Development Scotland is our vice chair. We had to develop a delivery and action plan for the local employability partnerships. And in doing so, we've identified who are our priority groups for support. The care experienced young people are amongst those priority groups. So I have to report back to the, the LEP, Local Employability Partnership, on a regular basis. And the reporting lines for the Local Employability Partnership are up into Aberdeen Prospers as part of the LOIP. So we're, we're feeding through. So I'm hoping that covers it, but I am going to look to my friends just in case there's anything more. Can I pass on the friend bit? No, I'm, I'm joking, I'm joking. Um, so we will see it coming through in, in part of the data, particularly around um, stretch outcome 6.1, which focuses on the increasing number of care experience young people accessing positive and sustained destinations will be the, the area where this element will feed into, so it, it will not be lost within our continuing business as usual activity. Excellent, that's good to hear. Um, have we any further questions? I'm looking around the room, I'm not seeing any hands and I'm not seeing any hands on the screen. Um, the report at page 78 had five recommendations and obviously the Chief Executive was suggesting an action that we take away. Can we agree the recommendations and to take away that action? Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, that takes us to 3.2. Um, which is the project. Chair, sorry oh. to, I, I just wanted to have, a, a, we didn't do the two charters, the, the over 50s um, charters and the COPD referrals um, as, as part of that discussion. And I just had a question around the, 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 the first one. My apologies, um, feel absolutely free. And if anyone else wants to come in on that, uh, please just indicate, thanks. Yeah, it was just um, it was just on the on the charter two point four. Um, I don't know if it was just me or I did get I did get a little um, muddled around the the fifty because I think it was fifty people, some or mostly who are over fifty. Would that be my reading of the um, the baseline for that charter? Sorry, Councillor McDonald. Um, in terms of the 50, so they're starting at zero and they're wanting to support 50 people and to sustain good quality employment. And they're going to have a focus for those 50 people being over 50 or from priority neighbourhoods. So the so we're starting at zero, trying to get to 50 with a focus on those two groups. Yeah, that's that. Thank you. That's really helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any further questions on those other two? Mr Robertson, thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, Chair. It, it's really um, in respect to the next charter around the um, COPD programme, and I, I very much welcome the recognition that uh, being physically active will be a very um, uh, good support for people either uh, trying to deal with the condition or trying to recover from it. There is great evidence that demonstrates that being physically active can obviously be a very positive intervention. So I'm a bit um, disappointed, I guess, to see that under the resources part of the report that there isn't anything actually being allocated as as yet to support the work. So it's a question really if the author of the report is with us as to what happens if resources <coughs> aren't found um, and how would the charter um, actually deliver its intended targets? That's a very good question. Do we have 
Mrs Swanson, do you want to try and take that? The report author isn't with us today, but my understanding is that in terms of the improvement methodology, the intention will be to test the change ideas of which there is resource available to test those change ideas. And at which point they, they have data to show that they have been successful, that they would come back to identify resource at that time if it hasn't already been identified. But the project are also working with the funding team within the council so that they can identify any other resources. Where, where were the, the resources being targeted from, just out of interest? I don't have that level of detail. Can I suggest maybe if we can take that offline and we could maybe perhaps circulate the response to all the members uh, and obviously, uh, you know, if you have any further questions out of that, we could maybe take that back at some point and for the next meeting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, one of my team's part of the of the project team, so I can pick it up through that. But it was just of interest, really, at this stage. Thanks, Joe. Yeah. No, it was just so that the rest of the board obviously are aware um, what the the response to that is. Do we have any other questions? Not seeing any hands, and I'm not seeing anything on on the board. So, in that case, if I can go back to page seventy eight and the five recommendations and the actions suggested by the chief executive, can we agree? Thank you very much indeed. Um, moving on again to three point two project end five point three. Uh, Mr. Simpson, do you want to take us through? Thank you. I have the pleasure of presenting the support on behalf of Gail, who unfortunately is not able to be here this afternoon. But really is just to recognise that we are presenting a report to demonstrate progress and indeed um, achieving the, the outcome here in terms of ensuring that all children in our secondary and uh, age 10 and above within our primaries and secondary schools have access to a school counselling service. Um, this has now been in place for a number of months and we certainly much see it as being part of our sustained business as usual activity going forward. And we're already seeing that service being very well utilised. It addresses the sort of the inconsistent offer that was available previously, where, where, where some counselling services were available in some schools, but not universally available across all of our, of our school groups around this as well. And so what you've got in front of you is a report which begins to sort of outline the progress that's been made and indeed the uphands, up, up skilling of our broader works, workforce in terms of their understanding of, of recognising emerging mental wellbeing needs within our young people. So happy to take any questions should there be so. Thank you very much. Uh, questions? Councillor Radley. Thank you, Convener, and thank you, Mr. Simpson. Um, it was Apologies if I missed it within the report. Um, it was just to get an understanding of how people actually access the counselling services, you know, within the school environment, if that's possible as a first question. Thank you. So through its range of means, um, for particularly our, our older young people, it will be self-referral. They will be able to access that themselves. Um, for others, particularly those perhaps younger, less confident, the, the, their needs can often be identified within through guidance and indeed other school staff as well. So it's about bringing the awareness of the service to the, all of our staff within our schools, including school nursing and, 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 and other um, staff groups um, aligned to our, our delivery of education provision across our schools. So it's not just those that are, are guidance staff, it's, it's much broader than that. But yes, there's also self-referral in there as well. Families can also self-refer if they've got the, the the needs of the young person so I don't know if that's where you're going. You just preempted my second question yes so there is some parental engagement around the services that are available yeah perfect um, and although there's monitoring of people accessing the service is there any mo monitoring of outcomes from those who have accessed it I don't know if that's if that's a possibility um, but people act numbers accessing the service show something but you know are there any sort of outcomes from the service being accessed, if that makes sense. So the intention would be is that we are going to undertake a wellbeing survey of our pupils on an annual basis, and that will form part of our ongoing evaluation as to the wellbeing of our pupils. Within that, we will not be able to identify which pupils have attended and, and correlate to whether their well-being has improved or not. But but clearly, we would, be, we would begin to draw some um, analysis and, and, and outcomes from, from the data that we're, we're hopefully going to build over time and get some trend data around that. Um, the first one has been done and obviously we'll be building that going forward as well. 
Perfect, thank you. My last question's um sorry. And my last question is just around um sort of accessing the service post COVID. Um obviously COVID has had a, a massive impact on the mental health of our young people. Um and have you seen um a, a sort of change of attitude towards the services that are available? You know, obviously that's become a a broader section that are able to access the services but have you seen a change in attitude towards the services that are available and more people access them, them as a result of the COVID pandemic? I think it's fair to say given the spotlight on children's mental health and well-being I think these conversations are happening in a more um, natural and spontaneous basis within within a whole range of different settings as well. So clearly at the outset of the pandemic, we th there was the psychological well-being hub established where young people could again self-refer or indeed be referred by others to access a limited number of appointments online. And, and certainly that, that, was, that worked for some, but actually for others, they missed that face-to-face -face engagement. And so certainly now we've got this offer in place and sustained, um, then, then we know that we, we can see the benefit of that. This has only been in place for a relatively short period of time yet. So uh, again, I think we, we still have to wait and see what that impact is. But but certainly, yes, I think it's just bringing that visibility and taking away some of the stigma actually that is wrapped around this as well is important. Thank you for that. Uh, I've got Luan uh, on the Teams. Thanks. Thanks. Um, Councillor Rad Radley beat me to it on the outcomes question, but uh, I need to be quicker with my hand. Um, but my other question is about how we're monitoring uptake in terms of ethnicity, gender, age and evolving the service. So it's so we are looking at adapting to make sure that it's accessible for all our young people and not just particular groups. Um, so th thank you, uh, Luan. I'm happy to take that back. I mean, I, I'm pretty certain the answer is yes. I think we are collecting that data, but I'm because I'm, I'm aware of where we're more speaking in terms of uptake from our Ukrainian young people who have arrived in the city as well. So from that perspective, I, I know that we're monitoring that. But whether or not there is reporting from the provider of of the service in terms of performance and and and, and in terms of the ethnicity, gender, age, all of that. Um, I, I can take that back into the service and, and provide the assurance. I, I'm, I'm confident of saying yes, but I would like to be very confident. Thank you for that. Uh, you, you mentioned Ukraine there, and that kind of um, prompted a little thought from myself. Um, you know, we've seen people come a considerable distance from a country that's experiencing, um, you know, real real problems and, and for these young people it would be difficult at the best of times to, to move um cultures um but are we starting to see um some of the sort of fallout from the continuing situation in ukraine affecting uh, some of those children that have come um you know fleeing a, a, a war because obviously some had hoped to be here a short time that may be changing and, and how young people perceive that um, may be, you know, adding down the line problems that, that weren't maybe very obvious when they first arrived. I wonder if we could have a little bit of commentary around that, please. Thank you. Um, over the summer, we adapted our summer of play offer to very much have a focus for our Ukrainian families who have arrived in the city. And that was very much play based and, and actually enabling through play for them to express emotions and just indeed uh, feel comfortable, more comfortable within within a new city, strange city, uh, and getting to know the, the sort of cultural expectations within, within Aberdeen as well. And so I think we, we, we often don't necessarily need to see it within sort of counselling services, but it's often through play and other engagements as well. Also recognising that many or and most of those children have come with a parent and, and, and or within a family member. So again, it's about how we're supporting the parents to understand the services that are available within our communities that they can hook into um, around that as well. So we very much certainly have offered enhanced support to DICE Academy, where a, a number of our Ukrainian families are attending and indeed DICE Primary as, as the, one of the feeder schools into that as well. So it's trying to make that offer as flexible without necessarily always having it as counselling service, if, if that makes sense, um, Councillor. Thank you. Um, 
No, that 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 does indeed. Th thank you very much for that. That was most helpful. Uh, Councillor Greg. Um, thank you. Um, I take a great deal of comfort from the report with the um, with the increased access to counselling and to interventions for young people. Um, but um, like yourself, um, I, I do worry about the future because we're, we're really only identifying um, a proportion of young people in need. I mean, there are the Ukrainians, um, our fellow citizens, the Ukrainians, but there are um, we're, we're, we are finding that there are indeed um, it does seem to be um, a growing area of concern. So look into the future. What what can the community planning partners, what can we do to work together to provide those interventions um, targeted, um, that that targeted approach, but also to 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 provide therapeutic and other other interventions to help in this growing area? Thank you, Councillor. Um, it's the intention of the Council to organise in the middle of October, the 14th of October, uh, a mental health summit, bringing together local partners um, together to think about how do we collectively respond to the um, the mental health and wellbeing needs of our young people within the city as well. And, and, and really listening to our young folk is, is part of that as well is really absolutely key. So it's it's not about p assuming a position of, of certainty, it's assuming a position of curiosity that actually we can learn and develop around that. So I think that summit will give us a window, um, provide a window of, of learning for us all to think about how do we develop and adapt our, our, our support offer to, to our young people within the city as well. And so I think that that's an area which we want to continue to see evolving over, over the course of the coming period of time. Yeah, thank you very much for that. Um, I think that that's something re really positive that we're doing locally. Um, and hopefully um, out of that will come um, collaborative so solutions um, so that we can you know, be more ambitious with our, with our um, aims and our stretch outcomes. Thanks. Thank you very much. Any further questions? I'm not seeing any hands and I'm not seeing anything on the board. Um, the recommendations for action are on page one, two, three. There are three of them. Can we agree them? Thank you. Uh, that takes us to 3.3 .3, project and 5.4 uh, again. Uh, Mr Simpson, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Again, standing in for Gail, um, who isn't able to be with us this afternoon. This is a, a report that recognises the very strong link between physical uh, activity and mental well-being as well, and, and recognising how we actually need to ensure that actually that offer of well-being support is, is not seen in a one-dimensional perspective as well. So, so very much the report is outlining the, the, the success of the Let's Get Physical programme and, and, and all of the other activities that have been around that, that as well. Um, and so that now, that, that offer of um, free activity is available to all of our young people um, going forward. And again, this is not very much seen as, as a, a project end. It's very much a project continuation. This project will continue to sort of deliver on, the, uh, on the ensuring that all young people have access to physical activity, which we know has clearly supports their, their mental health and well-being. But it's broader than that. And, and I think on page 126, it recognises the importance of sleep, the importance of, of recognising um, healthy body images and all of those aspects as well, which also links back to the eating disordered aspect around those as well. So so this is the, the, the work of this um, will continue. But I think in terms of having the assurance to, to the community planning uh, management group um, board this afternoon, I think we can be clear that the, the project has been met. But again, happy to answer any questions that have uh, members may have. Thank you very much. Questions, please. Councillor Radley. Thank you, convener, and thank you, Mr. Uh, Simpson. Um, it was around um, girls and young women accessing sport, especially within sort of a school-based environment um, as someone who went to school not too distant future, uh, past even. Um, it, it was always very hard. It was very difficult to encourage girls and young women to engage in PE lessons um, and sport on a wider basis, you know, free after school sport, things like that as well. Um, what work has been done specifically for the the girl section of 
of our schools um, and is that something that we're hoping to focus on more in the sort of future of the project? Thank you, Chair, and thank you for the question. Um, I, I think it's fair to acknowledge that there is still a challenge to get um, girls to engage on, as, on the same levels of sport activity as there is for, is for boys. But it's in thinking about seeing um, activity in its broadest sense. It's not simply about football or basketball or whatever it happens to be. It's about dance. It's about movement. It's about enjoying yourself and and and, and seeing other ranges around that. And so, seeing it in that broader context and seeing physical education and physical activity in that broader context is is really important. Whilst also promoting equal access to um, sport traditional sport activities should girls have a passion for that we've seen obviously the success of the, the English women team and, and again what that will mean for from a footballing context and so how do we capitalize on those um, successes and, 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 and engage with an appetite within our within our girls who are interested in that as well so it is about continuing to sort of see a diversification of, of our offer uh, within our schools as well. Thank you. Um, and I think, I, as you say, I think it's really important that you do have that sort of diversity of offering because not one size fits all, especially when it comes to PE lessons. Um, my second question is around sort of partnership working with other um, bodies. Um, I guess if we look at sort of the work of the link workers um, in GP practices and things like that, um, and the social prescribing side of physical education and how that's sort of linking in with mental health. Um, has there been much engagement with sort of GP practices, the health and social care partnership around maybe broadening the scope of, sorry, I don't know if I'm going too far, um, maybe broadening the scope of it um, further than schools and to sort of young people's wellbeing as a, as a whole? In relation to your specific question, I'm probably going to have to pass on that and come back to you. In relation to working with partners, yes, we, we are. We, we very much are. Sport Aberdeen are in the room this afternoon, and they're very much a part of this program as as well in our in our in our broadest offer to to our young folk as well. And so it is about seeing that as well. I am happy to take back the the social prescribing question, um, unless Luan has come up on the screen to provide an answer for that. Um, but I'll, I'll certainly take that away. And, and come back with an answer to that question. Thank you very much. Um, I, I'm looking at Mr Robertson and then I've got Luan on the screen. So we can maybe do it in that order. Thanks. <clears throat> um, it was really maybe just to add a bit more to what Mr Simpson said in respect to what's been done. Um, it has been a challenge, I think, for decades to try and maintain girls' interest in being physically active. And I think Aberdeen's actually pioneering um, a, a particularly successful initiative um, with work through what's called the Active Girls Committee. It's actually been recognised as exemplar, uh, A, because it's a partnership approach, but also because it's actually taking girls who have been uninterested in sport um, and helping those in schools uh, who feel or are, are in that similar space to, to see the advantages of being physically active and healthy. And I think <clears throat> today isn't the, 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 the time to go into a whole debate about why girls don't take part, but I think what Mr Simpson says, right, there's a formal part of, of physical education and there's an informal part of physical activity and that can be structured both in and out of school, extracurricular and within community clubs and community organisations. And I think there's a really strong collective effort across Aberdeen, uh, recognising the, the challenges of sustaining interest and, and getting girls involved. And, and we continue to push at it. Um, I'm, I'm very uh, impressed by the Charter's work. I have to say it's a, it's a very positive report and it's great to see that the work will continue. I'm pleased we are part of that. And I, you know, I do think Aberdeen probably um, hasn't had the recognition for the work it's doing compared to some other local authorities, but it, it's great that it's been highlighted today. I think uh, a, a great effort there. Thank you very much for that. Um, Luan, do you want to come in? Um, thank you. My question really was on uh, similar to the on the, the last um, project and thinking about how we will continually 
improve and evolve the, the, the offering to, to young people, particularly interested in what we're doing to make sure that pupils with additional support needs are also able to access um, the physical activity opportunities that are available. Um, not Maybe Graham won't have the answer for all that today, but I think it's important we are thinking about monitoring that quality um, of impact. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think Levan makes a really important point. Uh, within the report, we make reference to the, the recognition that ch children with care experience often miss out on some of those opportunities, through, whether that's through a lack of, uh, whether that's through just the family uh, deprivation circumstances or indeed just the, their, 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 their looked after status. So how can we ensure that those that isn't a barrier, that actually we are ensuring they have access to swimming lessons, cycle bikes and, and a range of activities as well around that as well? I think there is also a very clear focus on um, the health and movement of children with limited mobility, um, recognising that actually that that mobility is often really important for um, life extension and, and, and quality of life experience as well. So, so again, the, the education support officer who has been recruited as part of this also has within, within their remit thinking about the whole breadth of, of our pupil population, not just simply what would often be seen as the mainstream element of, of that as well. But I think it, it's recognised, I think um, Luan's making an important point that we, we need to see this as being for all young people and children and, and not just those with, with abilities um, around this. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I completely agree. That's a really important point. Any further? Councillor Greg. Um, thank you. Yes, um, I wanted to ask um, if there is any um, measurable impact um, f resulting from this action on um, the area of public health around obesity statistics and also on community safety. Um, my goodness, the questions are, are getting tougher. Um, <laughs> And so I am not going to waffle um, and, and make it up. So I, I, I absolutely recognise the obesity crisis um, that, that's facing us all. It is a public health crisis. That's how we have to view it. Um, important in terms of doing that. So um, can I take those questions back, Councillor Greg, and come back to you with, with a response, um, which I'll circulate through the committee. Thank you very much. Yes, the, the, the questions today are to the bone, I uh, would have to say, uh, which is always good. It's always good. Uh, any further questions for Mr Simpson? I'm not seeing any hands or anything. Um, page uh, 130 of the report has three re uh, recommendations for action. Can we agree the recommendations? Agreed. Thank you very much indeed. That takes us to 3.4, which is project end 9.3. And we have Roma Bruce Davis to speak to it. Thank you. Sorry, I'm looking the wrong way. <laughs> That's okay. Good afternoon. I've been looking that way. <laughs> Uh, good afternoon. So I'm Roma Bruce Davies. I was the locality reporter manager for SCRA uh, and I was leading on this project. So just to give a bit of background, what we were aiming to do was to increase by 10% the number of young people who were jointly reported by the police to SCRA and the procurator fiscal. Um, who were offered robust alternatives to the statutory system. Now, that was the phrase that went into the aim, but in actual fact, we chose to measure uh, the number of children and young people who were dealt with by the children's reporter, by SCRA. So joint reports, they're made by the police when they're either really serious offences uh, alleged to have been committed by children and young people or where the child or young person is already on a compulsory supervision order through the children's hearing system. So really it's about um, are those children who are jointly reported by the police going to be dealt with by the children's reporter in the children's hearing system? which is designed to uh, meet their needs and deal with them as children, or are they going to be prosecuted by the procurator fiscal and dealt with in the adult criminal justice system? So our, the context to our aim and the background to that, it was really aligned with the aims of the promise in particular to make sure that more children and young people, and specifically older, uh, older age groups, so the 16 and 17 year old age group. So that's why we chose to focus on them in particular in our aim. Um, the, the aim of the promise is to make sure that more of those children and young people are retained within the children's hearing system when they're alleged to have commit, 
committed uh, offences. It's also in line with the aims to uh, incorporate UNCRC, a Convention on the Rights of the Child, to make sure that children are dealt with in a justice system that is designed to meet their needs. What we also know is that children and young people who are in conflict with the law and who are charged with criminal offences um, tend to have uh, speech and language difficulties and needs. They've experienced trauma and crime uh, in their own lives as victims. Um, so exposure into the adult criminal justice system at an early stage can just compound those difficulties and be uh, damaging to them. So our aim was to increase by 10% the number of children and young people who were being uh, dealt with by the children's reporter and retained in the, the hearing system. So the specific changes that we tested, we looked really at a kind of two pronged approach and we tested a few different things. The first thing was around uh, increasing the knowledge and understanding of the workforce on um, the, uh, the way that joint reports are dealt with, processed by the police and into procurator, fiscal and reporter. And in particular, what are the specific factors that are taken into account that would determine whether a young person is prosecuted or whether they could be retained within the hidden system? So we did some learning sessions, we did briefing notes uh, and we rolled that out. And the second part that we were looking at addressing was around the communication of the specifics of how young people were going to be dealt with, what their care plans were, what the planned interventions were. And we looked at trying to change how that communication flowed better between social work, reporter and procurator fiscal, and we tried to tackle some delay in that. So those were, were our tests of uh, change. And then as you can see from our data over time, we did manage to uh, achieve our aim. We went from 33% of uh, children and young people being retained by the children's reporter and in the hidden system back in 2016-2017 uh, and we got up to 62% uh, in 2020 and 66% in 2021-22. So that's why we're seeking to close our project now because we have achieved our aim. We also measured uh, some uh, process measures as we went through. So we looked at the effectiveness of those learning sessions and there is some data in the closing report, um, pretty positive data and feedback about the effectiveness of the learning sessions uh, and the briefing information. So in terms of how are we going to sustain the improvements, we have, we have uh, just as a matter of course, um, this data is collected already by SCRA uh, and so that's something that's monitored and collected as business as usual so that will continue to be done. There's also the Youth Justice uh, Improvement Group within the, the city that will continue to monitor that data. I have in fact been monitoring the data for this year as we go and I can tell you that for the last, uh, from about March of 22, um, we've we've got the data sitting at 80%, just above 80%, and then 100% for the last few months uh, being retained within the children's healing system. So those improvements look like they're being sustained. We've taken some particular actions to make sure that this does become business as, as usual and that these improvements are uh, continue to be sustained. So we've had some case sampling activity just to see um, that uh, if there are any additional um, ideas for change that we could identify through that. And we've set up a working group. So the project team has really been um, continued in another guise as a working group to monitor the effectiveness of this. The learning sessions will continue on a rolling basis. Uh, and those changes that were made to the communication will continue. And there's also an improved system for managing delay. And the other thing in terms of the scale up and spread, um, so we're already dealing across the city with 16 and 17 year olds, but in my new role within Scottish Children's Reported Administration, we're looking to take some of the learning from this project and to scale that up actually across the country in terms of our improvements for children and young people. Um, so that's, um, that's a real positive and also um, good for Aberdeen that we can bring some of the learning there onto the kind of national um, actions that will be taken forward under our work to, uh, to keep the promise to children and young people and keep more of them within the children's hearing system. So I think that's the kind of summary of where we got to and how we're going to try to make sure that we sustain all of that, but happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Um, I've got Councillor Greg first, uh, if you want to take first. 
Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, it's good to see the sustained um, improvement um, looking forward. Um, I just have a question on um, the, the graph on four, on, on, at 4.2 on page 132. Um, I'm, I'm not sure what that means um there's the there's the doubling of those who have been retained by the, the reporter that's a percentage um do, you know has the volume of young people remained the same or or has it increased because that you know that might be a factor um that has affected the percentage I'm just looking for a little bit more you know background to that to explain that graph so the graph in particular so is that the Graph, sorry, 4.1. Um, four, at 4.2, percentage of young people aged 16 to 17 retained by the reporter. Just to get a little bit of context, um, I mean, because it, there's the doubling of, of the percentage, um, which is very, very stark. So, Yes, yeah, sure. So you're looking to see whether in terms of the actual numbers of children or people. Now, I Just don't have context. Yeah. yeah, I don't have that data off the top of my head, but I, I, I recall from when we were looking at the, the project, one of the challenges was that because we really focused in on 16 and 17 year olds, often the actual numbers were relatively low um, and there wasn't a huge variance in the numbers. <laughs> um, so I'm afraid I don't have the data in front of me here, but I could certainly look into that and provide some of that context in terms of the actual numbers of, of children that we were looking at. Well, just if that's not too much bother, because I mean, that, that explanation alone yeah. is is really helpful. I mean, that that's fine for me. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. So Simpson, do you want to come in? Thank you, Chair. Uh, again, just to recognise that actually there is a bill winding its way through the Scottish Government just now called the Child Children's Care and Justice Bill which will essentially will make it, will move the responsibility for 16 and 17 year olds to the to be exclusively within this, the, the children's reporter uh, element. Mm -hmm. Clearly there's within that, there is scope for, for very, very serious offences as, as well, but within that. So so this, will, this, this we're ahead essentially of where the bill will take us and, and this will become, as, as Roma has said, not just our practice, but, but nationally as well. Thank you very much. That was very helpful. Um, any further questions? I'm looking around. I'm not seeing any hands. The recommendations are on page 134, 135. There are two of them. Can we agree the recommendations? Great. Thank you. Um, moving on. Uh, thank you, Roma. Uh, 4.1. Um, Community Justice Scotland's Outcome and Performance and improve, Improvement Framework Presentation. Um, we've got Mr McGowan. Do you want to take us through the report, please? Yes, thanks, Chair. Um, I think uh, uh, Gogo is going to share the slides. There we go. Smashing, thank you. Um, yeah, so this is just to bring the, the board up to date with the development of the new outcome performance improvement framework. Um, the background here, as you'll see, is um, over the last 18 months or so, Community Justice Scotland, which is a statutory body, has been developing the revised OPIF. Um, effective implementation obviously would be key to success of the new framework and the improvement of those community justice outcomes. And, and you'll recall through previous um, discussion on this, that this is a statutory framework that community justice have to have um, and then it helps inform our local work here um, through national indicators but also local indicators. Um, so the, the context here is um, um, can a national convener, is, is it possible to expand the slides? It's quite hard to see them to go full screen. I'm just having the same problem myself. Um, <laughs> I don't know if we can. Can, can we Whoever has control of the screen, can we blow it up? Is that a bit more helpful? Yeah. Sorry, Mr. McGowan, if you want to maybe continue, I think no, I think we've fine. got it better at this end. Thanks. Yeah, OK, yeah, no problem. Um, so the, the context here is um, obviously a national one, but we need to ensure that um, we, we fed back, which we have done into from a local context and um, some of the, the 
the context at national level includes a new justice vision for the country that was uh, launched earlier in the year and the community justice vision as well. Um, and you'll see the Scottish Government's vision for justice there includes an aim to work together to address the underlying causes of crime and support everyone to live full and healthy lives. Um, that's an important aspect of the, the government's vision for justice, but, but only one aspect of it. Um, and so the consultation that has been ongoing since April last year um, around um, the, the development of this framework um, naturally leans into that, but also um, other areas such as the um, National Care Service that is um, obviously um, something we're looking closely at nationally. Um, so the, the OPEF elements here, um, just to, to display these, um, what we're looking at here are national indicators, um, but also supplemented with some local flexibility for local indicators that we know that the data we have locally um, will um, will be required to, to act on. Um, and this diagram just shows those national indicators um, and the other indicators there. Um, and then at the bottom, the, the care inspectorate. So scrutiny over them um, overall to make sure that uh, at a national level, those indicators are feeding into the, the statutory requirements for outcomes. Um, but there's a, again, is that um, local context being provided there. We can um, move on, Google. Um, and and what's not changed, as I mentioned there, that that wider landscape. So we have the national performance framework, the justice vision, the framework we're we're looking at at the moment, um, national care service, the promise, um, all these other national policies and strategies that are being developed that we've heard uh, about today as well um, will be playing into that. So we can move on again. Um, so what we have is a number of aims here. Um, there are a number of slides here. I won't take too long going through them. They'll be shared as well. Apologies, they weren't shared in advance, but there was a, a meeting on this last week and I wanted to make sure of the most up-to-date information to, to share with you all. So the proposed national strategy aim one is optimising the use of diversion and intervention at the earliest opportunity. So within there, you'll see two national outcomes, which are around increased access to person-centred support, to successful complete diversion from prosecution and um, that more people in police custody receive direct support to address their needs. Now, happily, these are, these are issues that we are already looking at as a, a community justice group and as a, as a partnership, so um, not really requiring any great change from us if these are approved. Um, if we can just move on um, again, Google. Uh, yeah, so some more detail here um, looking at specifically um, how that would be recorded, what those indicators would be, um, and uh, some of the partners we'd expect to take part in those discussions, um, including substance use, mental health, etc. Uh, the National Strategy Aim 2 is to is proposed to ensure robust and high quality community interventions and public protection arrangements are consistently available across Scotland. Um, so there's bail supervision and coordinated support proposal there. Um, and a and national outcome for, sorry, Gogo, could you just go back one, please? Um, looking at the proportion of people who successfully complete community sentences and access services to promote the assistance. Um, and you'll see at the bottom there, just a note against outcome three, that um, the, the framing that's been proposed is around the use of remand being decreased. So uh, um, we know separately there is a, a major pressure in the system around those being held on remand, the, the types of offence have been held on remand for and where community justice, uh, sorry, community sentences may be considered more appropriate in order to um, move the, the national discussion, the national debate um, and ultimately practice about community justice on. If you could move on, go, go, please. Um, and again, you'll see here the indicators proposed um, around bail conditions, um, the number of people remanded, so so fairly straightforward national indicators there. Um, but on local assessment, then what those mechanisms might be to support bail assessment and what those pathways might be, how they're developed and implemented to support that outcome overall. National outcome four there again, um, looking at those disposal disposals by court type. Um, and um, the, the proportion of overall sentencing um, and then that completion again of community disposals is really important with again that local assessment and, and flexibility in there around those pathways and um, um, the view of people with experience of community disposals is important because that brings the, the user voice in. Um, 
then this one's um, we get a few more outcomes in there, but national strategy aim three proposal around ensuring services are accessible and available to address the needs of individuals accused or convicted of an offence. Um, and that's around health and social care release uh, support rather following release from prison and um, increasing the proportion of those accessing suitable accommodation, the proportion of people with convictions accessing education, learning, etc. to uh, enhance their move into employment um, and more people accessing voluntary through care and support from third sector. Again, these are areas that we, I think, do well, well on already in the city, so won't necessarily require a huge change in, in focus from us uh, to achieve that. Um, and the national indicators on the next few slides just um, are set out to support that um, percentages of people receiving that care. Uh, if you could move on, Google, please. Um, uh, this one's important, obviously, around homelessness, and, and we're about to hear uh, some more about homelessness as well in the following agenda item, but looking at where housing advice has been provided, those uh, safe housing on release standards, the shore standards, for example, um, mention here of the no one left behind outcome framework potentially being implemented here and, and used, used as a comparator, um, and then those referral pathways as well um, in there. Uh, and finally, number eight here, um, voluntary through care assistance cases commenced and completed, um, numbers, number of people supported. This is all data that's available and can be tracked more effectively. Um, and then at number four, strengthening the leadership, engagement and partnership working of local and national community justice partners. So uh, three outcomes in here around improving collective leadership, uh, increasing capacity for lived experience engagement, which is um, you'll have noticed in some of the other slides earlier, um, an understanding of and confidence in community justice across the workforce and community increases, which is really important. Um, and again, uh, we're looking at the, the national indicators here, um, improved collective leadership. You'll see they're um, at the moment not, un, not able to identify a quantitative indicator around that, but some local assessment and progress listed there around accountability, how that's demonstrated, how consultation is undertaken and how that all feeds in. Um, and again, on this one, looking at what mechanisms are in place to engage and learn from lived experience in third sector. So. We have lived experience um, aims against our own community justice um, group that I chair, um, but also we have uh, community engagement in there on the board as a number of the other outcome improvement groups do to, to make sure we're, we're listening to what's happening in the community. Um, and finally, there that uh, increased confidence, that's something that we um, are aiming at uh, already again, but um, looking at that by custody, by sentence length, by the type of disposal, by the demand, as I mentioned earlier, um, and how that is felt and understood in the community is going to be really important going forward. Um, the next steps here, and this is this is the last slide. Um, you'll see that the date of the 30th September, um, so that's next week. The, the final recommendations um, will be submitted by uh, Community Justice Scotland to the Scottish Government uh, for um, for debate, for discussion um, and ultimately agreement. Um, and then the final recommendations will also be communicated to stakeholders nationally um, at the same time. Um, hopefully um, through October, we will get a decision um, and a soft launch by the Scottish Government on those. Um, there's no time scale for that as yet, um, but we know they've been consulted and um, they're aware of what's being developed. So. Uh, my hope would be that that comes through sooner rather than later. Um, and the ultimate date here for, for publication and for community justice groups uh, and community planning um, authorities across the country is the 1st of April to have these in place. Um, I think it's important to state that the, the, what's been built in here is local flexibility. So these national indicators we would want to ensure we're complying with and, and, and working towards meeting but also we still have the scope within that framework to introduce local indicators where uh, local issues are, are arising or there is um, a data-led need to approach a project or start a project in a different way. So um, certainly by the 1st of April next year, we'd expect to be in line with this. Um, and what it probably does mean is from our own uh, outcomes that we've identified, we will just need to review them once the final national indicators are identified, just to make sure that 
um, we are still working towards them. Um, my assessment at the moment is that, as proposed at the moment, um, there wouldn't be too much change required from us at a local level, but I'd come back, obviously, to yourselves and, and confirm that. So um, I'll stop there um, and happy to take any questions and hopefully um, I'll be able to answer them. Thanks, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, can, I, can I give you the first question from myself? Um, th there's obviously a, a, a very you know, interesting and tight timeline there, but some of the matters you were referring to in the presentation uh, are going to very much come on the back of legislation that is only now starting its progress through uh, the parliamentary process. I suppose really that poses the question, how confident are we that those aims and objectives will be achieved? Uh, we all know that legislation can be changed uh, along the way sometimes uh, for good or bad, but that's the nature of the system. Um, maybe a wee comment or two about that, please. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so it's a good point, and I think a number of them you, you've picked up correctly that um, potentially could be subject to some change depending on what legislation is finally enacted. I, I think the only commitment I can give is that we will we'll keep them under review. Um, obviously, as a um, as a partnership um, and as individual agencies, we respond to consultations that are, that, that are issued on legislation. We would look to do that. Um, and, and obviously, the commitment is that um, if anything changes in this, then we would we would make sure we were still aligned with it. Um, but but I think you're right. There's a bit of um, probably crystal ball gazing in some of these ones just now. Thank you very much. Can I have questions, please? I'm not seeing any hands, uh, in which case, thank you very much in, indeed. Um, and in that case, we'll move on to 4.2, uh, ending homelessness in Aberdeen. Um, and it's Mr Gardner. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. So um, the paper in front of you today is a proposed um, group to help to pro in response to the proposed Prevention of Homelessness Legislation from the Scottish Government. Um, they're currently finalising the analysis of the consultation um, that they've done on this. And I guess the, the group would help Aberdeen and Community Planning Aberdeen prepare um, for the forthcoming uh, legislation that we're expecting. Um, the proposal is to sit it under Stretch Outcome 11, Resilient, Included and Supported, which already includes the uh, Stretch Outcome to Reduce Youth Homelessness by 6%. Um, the, proposal is that we develop small tests of change um, in preparation for the legislation and because we believe that the aims of the legislation we should already be doing which is to prevent homelessness and I think as we've already heard today um, in other reports there's so many parts of our um, public bodies and third sector that are interwoven into the prevention of homelessness and um, so it's a key that we do this as a community planning um, body the the proposal will be to use the um, prevented rare, brief and non-recurring framework, um, which we've been developing with the Centre for Homelessness Impact in Aberdeen City Council. Um, and what we're looking to do again is to understand what our measures and outcomes would be to prevent homelessness. Thank you very much. Questions? I'm not seeing any hands. You, you've obviously... Oh, Chief Executive. Mrs. Scott. Graham, it's a pity you weren't called Angela too, because um because you're equally passionate about all that, that you do and and in your modesty are are not describing all that you've done to get us to the position that we are in as a as a city. And the fact that we're sitting here, you asking community planning partners to really come together in advance of legislation, I think is is credit to you, Graham and your leadership around this agenda. So I just wanted, didn't want all the praise to go to Angela's and, and Graham not to get his share of it, Councillor Nicholl. I just had a slight question, because if memory serves me, this does place a duty on GPs as well, which isn't going to be without its challenge for our GP colleagues. So just thinking around in the membership of that group, we, ord we ordinarily kind of take the IGB partnership for representing all of that, but I just wondered if you are exploring a particular GP representation on the, 
membership. I know, Graham, I'm only saying it because when we've been doing the test of change around the suicide reviews, I know that, that it's been challenging again for GP colleagues to be part of that, but they bring a lot to the to the table. So it's just what, what what's the discussions around GPs being represented in their own right on the proposed group? Thank you. In common with Andrew, as I can say, I also love my job. So um, um, thank you for the, for the recognition. So um, we have a specific GP practice um, in Aberdeen around home assisted Mary Well practice. Um, I'm meeting with them most weeks at the moment, so I could certainly take up the conversations with them and with um, Alison McLeod via the um, IGB who helped Aberdeen City Council prepare for the response to this. And that's where we linked into the GPs because um, you're right to pick that on. I know that it's been um, one of the challenging areas with the consultation responses that the Scottish Government are having to consider about that um, proposal to put the responsibility on GPs to ask um, around someone's housing situation and refer to the local authority, um, which might slightly change their roles from what they're currently doing. Thank you very much. Any further questions? I'm not seeing any hands. We have two recommendations at page 143. Can we agree the recommendations? Oh. Apologies, Chair. Sorry, Luanne, sorry. Yeah, it was just to offer um, from that description, it does sound like a different ask from GPs. So Mary well, you know, does a really good job in a specific area, but there may well be a need for wider GP involvement. So happy to make that connection if, if that's helpful um, after the meeting. Um, thanks, Luanne. It was just to say that Alison had made that um, offer on your behalf in terms of the Aberdeen Health and Social Care Partnership um, roundabout management group. So um, it, has, it has been picked up. I'm not saying it's going to be easy to resolve, but it is on the radar. Thank you. Do, do you want to come back on that? Oh, no, you've gone off screen. I'll, I'll take it not. OK. Um, as I said, the recommendations on page 143, there are two recommendations. Can we agree the recommendations? Thank you very much. Um, 4.3, keeping the promise. Mr Simpson, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm not going to take you through the 55 pages of this report, but I do have a, a very brief presentation. It's just literally seven slides, which maybe help frame this. So I'm just if I could ask Google to put that up on the screen for people to, to see that. But while she's doing that, it's just as a means of introduction. People will recall that the Independent Care Review, The Promise, was published in February 2020. Um, six weeks before COVID landed, and, and that really has distracted, I think, a lot of focus. The responsibility for delivering the promise, um, it falls upon the Community Planning Partnership, incumbent in upon us all to absolutely uh, do that as well. And as a, as a slide, uh, uh, go, go, any chance you can make that full screen just so people can see that? Um, but as the, the slide shows, there are five elements to that. One is around voice, s s ensuring that the voice of our young people and their families is very much at the heart of our service transformation and thinking. But we are thinking about the, the people who are delivering the care to, the, to our young folk and, and supporting them. Um, and also the really the importance of the family, that the aim of the promise is that children who can and should be children should unless it's unsafe for them to do so should be kept in care in the care of their families wherever possible and 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 certainly the element of that is then improving the care to deliver improved outcomes for that but clearly the black line around the heart is the scaffolding which recognizes that there is a need for transformation both within the legislation and the regulatory framework that actually surrounds the, de the delivery of children's services in its widest context as well. The as a substance to that, thank you, Gogo. Um, following on from that, on the 31st of March 2021, the Plan 21-24 was published, and it's the first of three three-year plans that will be um, taken forward right the way through to 2030. So the implementation of the promise is going to be seen as a 10-year programme of activity. And there are five sections within Plan 21-24, a good childhood, whole family support, supporting the workforce, building capacity and indeed planning. So 
we have begun an, on a partnership basis to really drive forward the, the changes that we want to see uh, coming out on, on delivering the promise um, going forward as well. And what we have done is begun to do our evaluation of, of where we feel we've got to in year one of Plan 21-24. What you've got in front of you on the screen just now is Change Programme 1, which is the Promise Scotland's evaluation of where Scotland has got to in terms of delivering the promise. And I put it up simply because it mirrors the, the template that we have tried to use for ourselves to try and get that consistency and rigour into where we're absolutely going as well. There isn't at this point in time a... a a statutory requirement to report on delivery of the promise. I think that's coming. And so I think, again, we're just getting the ducks lined up to enable us to be well placed for that as well. Um, going back to that heart slide, uh, please, the go, go, the month there. Thank you. So the promise in itself isn't just seen within the context of one policy document. It actually sits across a whole range of, of our strategic uh, landscape in terms of the LOIP, in terms of UNCRC, children's rights, it's the children's services plan, all of those in themselves will contribute to the totality of delivering the promise and, and really fall at the heart of what Community Planning Aberdeen is, is about and, and has responsibility for as well. So th there is probably more that we need to squeeze into that, that diagram, but nonetheless, I do think it's a helpful framing of, of the strategic landscape that, that absolutely is there as well. Moving on, Gogo, thank you. So this is the Promise Scotland's evaluation of where Scotland's at, at the, in year one of delivering on the promise as well. Um, and, and it shows the green is work is underway, where, where there's quite good progress being made to take forward the aims. The blue section, the largest section, which is perhaps not unsurprising, is suggesting that there is some, some work underway, but there's not really appear to be sufficient at this point in time. And then the yellow is actually where there is little or no work underway as well. So again, we have used that template to give ourselves an evaluation. So Google, if you could move on to the next slide, you'll see it broadly mirrors where, where we're at. And there's maybe a, some, some percentage differences. So again, as well to give assurance that the yellow sections that are where we haven't really started, they are requiring um, a national response in the first instance. So it's requiring action from government before there is action then progressed at a local level as well. So so there is there is a little areas around there as well. So by and large, I think the areas where we have where we need to make change, we have begun to do that. And clearly what we would want to see is that pie, pie chart becoming more green over the course of, of the coming years as well uh, and that will certainly make me happy um, and as I'm sure it will make everybody else happy as well. So so that's just our progress and, and, and some of the commentary is in that as well. So just again an ask is that actually the promise isn't just about improvement, it is about a fundamental shift in terms of and a cultural shift in terms of how we think about and deliver services to children and their families if we're going to implement the, for, the promise. It's not about tinkering around the edges, it's going right to the heart and redesigning how we, we think about service provision and, and, and our responses to children who have significant vulnerabilities within within their circumstances. It's it's also about enabling and requiring ages to engage in that continuous improvement. And as leaders, I would just ask that we all take that back into our own systems and actually ensure it's everyone's job to keep the promise uh, going forward as well. Pulling together the evaluation, um, I'm not going to lie, was a headache. Um, and, and so, again, just ask for, for agencies really to see this as not, a, not an additional ask. It's actually part of the day job that we've all got to do to actually record and report on what we're actually doing to, to do that. So, again, we, will, we want that to just sort of continue to see that going forward as well. So, really, hopefully that's been helpful, but i um, happy to answer any questions that, that you may have on the report. If, if I could start um, by saying thank you very much for that. Um, I, I, I think um, it's, it's, this is a substantial piece of work uh, that's going to be followed over the next few years. And uh, if, if I could say, you know, you can actually hear it in your voice, your passion for delivering this. 
um, and, and I do look forward to seeing the updates. And, and I think we will be turning a large part of that pie chart green the next time we see this. So thank you very much indeed. It really is most appreciated. If I could maybe open the questions and I've got Councillor Greg. Thanks. Um, thank you. Yes, um, I, I convener, I share your your desire to see that pie chart um, move in the right direction. And um, I suppose that that's why we have the um, the recommendations which are um, actually quite quite strong, requiring um, involvement and support from partners. Uh, it's 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 a really friendly and constructive community planning partnership that, that we have already. So I mean I'm I'm very confident that that's that that request and indeed requirement for collaboration is going to is going to happen. Um, but I'd just like to have some further I'd just like to have some further reassurance um, that that will happen. So that we can I think Mrs. Beatty is going to take that one. Thanks. So yeah, absolutely, Councillor Greg, and we are very collaborative in terms of how we work in this. But I guess um, when this was brought to the management group, um, I and Davy Housen from the police, who is the vice chair, were really clear around about what everybody's responsibility is because I think there is a bit of a tendency sometimes because it seems to be dealing particularly with children that it's an Aberdeen City Council um, issue but the reality of it is is it's the community planning partnership that's responsible for delivering so what I don't want to do is get to 2024 and everyone to be you know, saying why weren't we clearer? So the, risk, the the recommendations probably are quite strong, but I think that was under my um, my sort of urging just to make sure that everyone was really clear about what their responsibilities are. Just come back on that. Yeah, thanks. That I mean, that is very comforting. Um, we we've we've seen in the in the report, um, really good progress made with um aftercare and with the pathway planning. Um, for young people, and and to me that that is a joint um, that is a joint success. I mean that that requires the participation of not just the council but of others. So um, I would have thought that that significant you know evidence of improvement would would in, would inspire um, all of those in the partnership to you know to continue with their with their help and their support. I think the story um, of Gemma with the blue hair uh, sticks in my mind at this point in time and, and again from the Angela who's no longer with us um, that, that that shows the partnership but it also recognises that actually it is everyone's responsibility. I think the, the project update in relation to 16 and 17 olds in conflict with the law, that's not just Kate and my own responsibility, it's all of us to think about how we support those young people in our communities who will at times be problematic in terms of their behaviours and but how we respond proportionately and effectively to meet their needs is, is, is all of our responsibility. We know that this group as well have often unmet health needs. How do we absolutely ensure that their health needs are fully met in, in terms of thinking about that as, as well? So, so I think much of the conversation, if not all the conversation this afternoon, touches on this report in, in some level. Thank you. Um, I've got Luan online and Luan, you make my life easy because you put your camera on, which is much easier to see than that yellow circle around you. Thank you. Thanks. Um, really, really important area, of course, um, this is. I was just reading the Children's Services report that, that's contained in our pack and Obviously, there's a huge focus on culture and continuous improvement and early intervention. What, what's not really clear in the report, and maybe it's just my reading of it, is that the actions that we're in it at the moment are heavily focused around statutory um, partners. And I wonder, are we clear about the intent of the role of the third sector and how how they how they have a key role in delivering um, the the actions and just how will this be achieved really with with involving the third sector? Here, it's okay through you. Um, um, thanks, Loanne, and you're absolutely right. So again, 
part of the emphasis of Plan 2124 is uh, family support and, and recognising the delivery of a whole family wellbeing support. It's, it's, not, it's, not, it's a shift away from focusing perhaps exclusively on the needs of the child to focusing on the needs of all members of the family um, and recognising that the predominant reason children become known to children's social work is because of issues and, and issues within, the, within their parents' lives. So how do we absolutely shift a focus to actually thinking about how we build resilience within the parenting capacity of, of the parents, which better means the needs of the child can be met. So the, the, the council and its partners are together working uh, with, with the IGB um, around how do we develop a whole family support model that actually we can, we, we can actually roll out across the city and it actually begins to make that, sh that shift. Third sector partners are very much part of that in terms of the four thematic groups that are, are established, which are one, focusing on children with disability, two, children who are in conflict with the law, three, children who are whose lives are affected by trauma, and four, the children who are on the edge of care. And within each of those groups, there is a third sector representative as well is also thinking about how we commission services differently as well. I think we have to, the promise as part of that scaffolding tells us we need to revisit and rethink about how we, we, we commission services and do that on a, on a, a partnership basis, but also I think doing it in a way which um, brings third sector partners as equal partners to the table, not only where their, their voice is equally heard, but where they also hold equal responsibility for delivering on the outcomes around it as well. So, so that's certainly something that myself and Martin together are, are thinking about how we take that forward over the course of the year ahead as well uh, to, to ensure that we actually commission services that families need and, 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 and recognise as, to meet their wants as well. Thank you very much. Any further questions? I'm not. Oh, Mrs. Scott. Uh, thank you, Councillor Nicol. Luan, it's just to build on your point. I think the work that the Health and Social Care Partnership have done on the Granite Consortium is, a, is an exemplar for us now to take into the context of children's services. And again, colleagues within the consortium did an initial annual report, Luan, which I think I think you considered at the IGB board. So we'll certainly be learning lessons from the work that the partnership did around the Granite Consortium and how we absolutely commission in a very, very different way with third sector partners. And and, and I'm sure colleagues um Luan will want to pick your brains around that whole experience as well, along with colleagues that are in the consortium. So we will follow, I think example of the health and social care partnership. Thank you. Luan, do you want to come back in? Sorry, I saw you come up on the camera. Um, no, just really happy with that response and, and yeah, happy to share the learning from, um, from what we've done with the Granite City Consortium. Thanks. Thank you very much. Are there any further questions? I'm not seeing any hands or anything on the screen in that case. Page 149, there are three recommendations. Can we agree the recommendations? Thank you very much indeed. That takes us to item 4.4, .4, the Child Poverty Action Report. Uh, Mr McGowan, do you want to take us through the report? Yes. Um, thanks, Chair. Um, yes, yeah, so this is the Child Poverty Action Report for 2021-22. Um, you, you'll see the, the appendix there that has a number of um, different measures, um, the success um, and what we're doing as a partnership to, to address child poverty. Um, this is obviously the previous financial year um, and one caveat to this is that this, um, unlike previous years, um, has been undertaken without the use of national data, which, which isn't available at a reliable sense um, following the pandemic. So. What this sets out is what we've been doing locally around uh, meeting the child poverty targets that are set out there um, at 2.1 and 2.2 of the report. Um, you'll see at 4.1 um, that the, the current assessment is that around 5,500 children in the city um, are um, in child poverty, 21.8%. Um, um, that's defined as below 60% median income. 
after housing costs. Um, and as I said, the, the report, the appendix that's attached sets out the measures that have been taken by the Council, NHS and other partners uh, in order to tackle that. So um, I won't um, say any more about it, Chair. Happy to try and answer any questions that they may have. Thank you very much indeed. Councillor Greg, thanks. Um, thank you. It's a, it's a really helpful and very detailed report um, about a, um, a, a really troubling um, issue of, um, of growing vulnerable, growing um, levels of vulnerable young people. So that's hugely worrying. So um, it is a historical report and I'm just wondering, um, there's a mention that the um, group, the um, poverty group will be meeting again and will report back. So I'm just wondering, you know, what's the what's the method of reporting? Or is it, will 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 they be um, um, presenting an action plan or for looking ahead? Um, based, and I presume that they will have that there will have to be ongoing um, analysis of of the of the demographics of this growing um, level of child poverty in in the city. Um, I mean, I'm thinking of some of the specific areas that are mentioned in the report, such as positive destinations over the last, um, um, I think it's five, five or six years, it's quite, it fluctuates, you know, we're not seeing really, def to me, it, it, it doesn't look, look like a really definite trend in a, in a good, um, in a good direction for positive destinations. So I'm just thinking, you know, looking ahead, what, how will that be organised? Yeah, thanks, um, Councillor Greg, through yourself, Chair. Yeah, the, the next meeting of the Community Planning Aberdeen Anti-Poverty Group is um, it started next week. Um, and what we'll be doing is um, one of the aspects we'll be taking forward is refreshing the um, the Child Poverty Action Plan for the city. So that's mentioned there in the report, as you spotted. Um, we need to do that again um, because the, the current term has um, has run out. The, the Scottish Government have reissued or, or revised um, their national plan and we need to follow suit now in terms of those timelines. So um, we'll be doing that. Um, we need to do that at a partnership level. Um, and, and as you've spotted there, there are some some trends that are perhaps making the progress we would want to. Um, we're aware of the data locally um, and understand what the targets are nationally. So um, I guess there's a broad, a broad commitment to make sure that the, the data that is available in the city is understood to respond to it. But also looking at those um, national targets, making sure we're working towards them. And again, probably similar to the community justice earlier, that gives us some some national standards, but some local flexibility to make sure we're doing what we need to do in the city as a partnership to to address these. Thank you. Any further questions? I'm not seeing any further hands. So in that case. The recommendations at page 207, there are three. Can we agree the recommendations? Agreed. Um, that takes us to uh, report 4.5, the child poverty six monthly update report. And again, back to you, Mr McGowan, please. Thank you. Yes, thanks, Chair. And um, this is a report on work that's been done this year, um, as opposed to historical data. Um, and um, a bit of a shorter report uh, and the main uh, information here is contained in section two of the report, which um, lists a number of the, the steps that were taken uh, so far this year and continue to work on. You'll see um, some of the work we've already heard from earlier this year around community pantries, um, the ABZ Works platform, unclaimed benefits, um, etc. So some good work that we've already heard from here. Um, including the provision of um, over three million in grant funding um, uh, to various organisations and participatory budgeting techniques to to make sure that this is this funding is available across the city. Um, also, some are in the city activities um, that were ongoing at the time of the report being written um, that that have also been mentioned earlier today. Uh, and ongoing provision, I think, really importantly, of free school meals um, and efforts to increase. Um, the take up of those meals by those eligible. Um, so um, a bit of a shorter report, and this is um, like a six monthly report on what's happening in year um, at the moment. Thanks, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, any questions? I'm not seeing any hands. We're asked to note 
uh, the work that's been undertaken at page 259. Can we agree? Thank you. Uh, that then takes us to 4.6, the meeting dates for the 2023, which are contained in the report. If I could ask you to bear with me for, for just a moment, if we could end the recording there. And uh, I did note that obviously earlier in the meeting, um, we, we were told that there was um, a, a, possibly a, a wee update um, regarding